Lord, you are my shepherd, and I shall never want. You make me to lie down in the places of your rest. Oh, Lord, you are my shepherd, and I shall never want. You make me to lie down in the places of your rest. You fill me up. shall never want. And we shall never want. We have drinking of your water. And 
and we thirst no more. We've drinking of this water and we thirst no more.
Just for you. Here am I, oh God, redeemed by you. Here am I, oh Lord, to worship you. Here am I, oh God, created for your praise. Created for you. worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our God our maker for he is our God Lord you are our God Jesus you are our God, and we are your people. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture, the sheep of your pasture. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, oh, and the sheep of his hand, we're the sheep oh, of your hand. We come and worship and bow down to you, Lord. And we kneel before you, Lord, our God, our maker. We come to you, Lord, and bow down. And we kneel to you, O Lord, our God, our maker. For you are God, and we are the people of your pasture, and the sheep oh, of your hand, oh, the sheep of your hand. 
the sheep of your hand, Lord Jesus, the sheep of your hand. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We love you. Oh, we love and adore. Your holy name, oh, we love you, Lord, we love you, oh, we love and adore your holy Oh, how wonderful oh how marvelous is my Savior's love for me oh how wonderful oh how marvelous and my song forever Blessed is your name, Lord. Blessed is your name, Lord. Blessed is your
members the sea. Let your glory fill this earth. Oh, as the water covers the sea, let your glory fill this earth. Lord, fill me now. <laughs> Lord, fill me now. Lord, fill me now. Let your river flow out. Lord, fill me now. Let your river flow out. I come to drink. I come to drink of the water of life. <laughs> I come to drink of the spirit right now. I cry to the rock. Let the water flow out. I cry to the rock. Christ Jesus, let the water flow out. I cry to the rock. Christ Jesus, let the water flow out. Lord, give me to drink. Lord, give me to drink. Let your water flow out. Lord, give me to drink. Ha ha. Lord, give me to drink. Let your water flow out. Lord, give me to drink. Let your river flow out. Hallelujah. I am my beloved's and he is mine. I'm drinking of his water right now. Uh, I'm my beloved, and he is mine. I'm drinking of his life right now. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. I'm drinking of his water right now. I'm drinking of his water right now. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. I'm drinking of the Spirit right now. Hallelujah. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. I'm drinking of the Spirit right now. Oh, I'm my beloved, and he is mine. I'm drinking of the Spirit right now. I'm drinking of the Spirit right now. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you wear. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Oh, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. In what you hear, let me be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Oh, I'm going to be a sweet, sweet sound. I'll be a sweet, sweet sound. I'll be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Because oh, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Oh, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound. I'll be a sweet, sweet sound. Oh, I'm a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Well, cause I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. And I'll join my king in what you give. I'll be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. I'll be a sweet, sweet
down. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for the fountain that will never run dry. The fountain that flows from your throne. Thank you, Father, for the fountain that will never run dry. It's the fountain of your love and wonderful, abundant life. Amen. Amen. You say it too. Hallelujah. Father, I adore you. Lord, we adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Lord Jesus. We adore you, Lord Jesus. We adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Lord Jesus. We adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Christ the Lord. We adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Christ Jesus. We adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, for you alone are worthy. Oh, for you alone are worthy. Oh, for you alone are worthy, Christ the Lord. Oh, God, we'll give you all the glory. Lord, we give you all the glory. Oh, we give you all the glory. Christ the Lord. Because you alone are worthy. Oh, you alone are worthy. Oh, you alone are worthy. Christ the Lord. Come, Jesus, now be glorified. Come, Jesus, now be glorified. Come, Jesus, now be glorified in all this earth. Come, Jesus, now be glorified. Come, Jesus, now be glorified. Come, Jesus, now be glorified in all of this earth. Be seen right now in the midst of your church. Be seen right now in the midst of your church. Be seen right now, Lord Jesus, in the midst of our lives. Be seen right now in the midst of your church. Be seen right now in the midst of your church. Be seen right now, Lord Jesus, in our lives. There's a generation that does not know. There's a people, Lord, who've never seen. Come be glorified, be revealed, Lord Jesus, in our lives. Almighty God, we praise you. Almighty God, we praise you. Lord Jesus, we adore you. Be magnified. 
be magnified. Oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified in my life. Oh Lord, oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified in my life. Oh God, be glorified. Oh Lord, be glorified. Oh, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. Father, we are in such need of you. Father, we hunger and thirst after you. <laughs> oh, Father God, we pray in Jesus' name again, revive your work in the midst of us. Oh, God, we pray in Jesus' name, revive again your work, oh, Lord. Well, I believe that the best possible music that you can be doing is uh, just praying. It's prayer set to, set to music. That's the best possible praise that you and I can engage in. Hallelujah. Just give me this. Just, I want you just to praise him. I want you to sing your own song to him and just tell him that you love him. Just a melody, please. Just a little melody. Hallelujah. 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 Kura mama mandeli na mangelo. Jiri mama mala na manje ni sene. Kura mama mama mandeli na mangelo na mangol. Somebody. Gambale na mangi to sibre me. Hallelujah. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Ha. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Ki brava mamma bate se prebeto jo. E breve bando do dovere de quito do Roma se para nei prebe che si e tu gli vai. E riba rostai. E breve coscia nei. Ambro basute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, mamma ma che se fe. You know, there is a worship that is so important to the Father that He sent His only begotten Son for the sake of allowing you and I to be able to step into this realm. I mean, He paid it. God offered a great sacrifice. God offered a great sacrifice so that you and I could step into a place of communion and fellowship with Him. It's just so beautiful, so wonderful. It can only be described as joy unspeakable and full of glory, peace that passes understanding. Can only begin to be imagined as, as though it's the river. It's like, 
the life of God so flowing through us with such great force and capacity that all that Jesus could do in his infinite wisdom and understanding was to liken it unto rivers flowing out of us. Now I'm telling you, if there's anything I desire, it's that. You could be seated. You know, I, I've been, I, I've actually lived, I've actually lived through two, well actually, I've lived through three revivals, three great moves of God. My dad lived through, my da dad lived through two before I came into this world. My great grandpa, who was a Southern Baptist preacher that got baptized in the Holy Ghost in 1920, he lived through several great revivals. And I mean, I could go back and just in my family history, and I mean, it's almost that we've been connected to some degree with almost every great move of God in the United States of America. You know, and I, I got to, I grew up sitting, I grew up sitting around the, uh, the dinner table listening to all the great exploits, all the great things that God did. I mean, Southern California, Father did some amazing things. God raised up so many champions in Southern California and, and, and in, the, in the 60s. I mean, I got to live, I, I got, to, I mean, I was 12 years old and when the, when the, Jesus movement was going strong you know Geneva and I you know our dad had us and all the ministries we were around we were right in the big middle of everything you know and you know I praise God for that I praise God for the things that we saw and seen in that great move of God and there was you know a great move of God that we saw again a sweeping move of the spirit in the mid 90s and but there's nothing happened like those things that there's nothing happened like this Good, good There's nothing that's happened like those things that I've, that you know, that I got to sit around and listen, uh, people talk about, you know, and the great signs and wonders, the great miracles. My mother was raised in a church. It was uh, one of the great Pentecostal churches of the South in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and out of that church came many great men and, and women of God, and they used to. Now listen, my mother, she's in heaven with the Lord right now, and, and everybody who knew her, she wasn't a woman of very many words. But when she spoke, and you know, when my mother got to speak, when my mother started talking, she talked about things that were just, just sincere and, and sober. My mother's a very sober person. We didn't ever see mom get too excited, though she was Pentecostal. And you know... And, and raised in the midst of miracles. My mom never really got too excited. I mean, you never really got to see mom too excited, did you? I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? She, but when she got, when she started talking about the move of God, she'd start getting, she would start getting, a, she'd start getting a little, she'd start getting a little turned up. And she'd, she'd tell us about how that, they would sit in the, me, in, in the meeting, and we're talking about a church of a couple of thousand people now. And the power and the glory of God would, would come and begin to move in the midst of the church. It's late 30s, early 40s. The power and the glory of God would move in the church. And you couldn't see across the sanctuary. Because there was a cloud and glory in the place. You couldn't see across the sanctuary. Now listen, I'm, I'm not interested in all the manifestations. I'm interested in the presence. It's just that the presence, that, that, uh, that level brings a manifestation. I'm not interested, don't get me wrong, I'm not interested, I'm not interested in all the stuff. I'm interested in him. I'm interested in touching that realm that the word of God describes to us that Jesus great, went to great, to great pains to give us an opportunity to enjoy. He went, Father, the kingdom of God went to great expense uh, to pay our entrance fee <laughs> so that we can come and enjoy this fellowship. Tonight we're going to have fellowship in a unique way with the Lord. I mean, there was a time in my life where I would just pour a cup of the juice and I would lay some matzah out and I would just eat and drink while I was preaching because I just wanted to show people that this is a symbol of something that we have in reality in a communion and in an intimacy and in a fellowship with the Lord Jesus. We try to make everything so, we try to make so everything so ritualistic, uh, so liturgical. We try to confine it to religion when Father's not interested <laughs> in religion. I, I remember when I I remember when I picked up as 
a book by a Baptist pastor out of Houston, Texas, Steve Meeks. It's called Relational Christianity. And I, you know, and I began to read that book, and it was back in the late 70s that it was written. And I, I said, yeah, this is exactly who I am. This is exactly what I want. Baptist preacher stands up and begins to describe to people what they're missing out on when they, when they get stuck in a ditch of ideas and concepts. Listen, if it was based upon our ideas and concepts, if it was based upon our ability to intellectually understand who God is and how he functions, none of us would be saved. The Father hasn't relegated it to the ability for us to understand. I mean, Jesus was around the smartest people that you could possibly have within the framework of the Pharisees. They are the Haradim, those who tremble at the Lord, at the presence of the Lord, the tremblers. That's the, uh, the, that's the people that we call the Pharisees. And very different, unique names to describe who they were. And that's who Paul said he was. He said, concerning the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. That's pretty radical, eh? Can you imagine that? He said, concerning the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. He was so set on being able to touch that realm of glory that every Pharisee that had been trained since the days of Ezra, who instituted a radical school of consecration. I mean, you look, read, Ezra was a radical guy. I don't know, I haven't ever seen anybody have the same kind of response to sin as Ezra. Pulls out his beard, pulls out his hair, rips off his, you know, upper garment, sets in sackcloth and ashes. Oh, God, we're, we need your help. You know, I've never seen such despair out of anybody. It's almost embarrassing when you read it. You know, Ezra, get a hold of yourself. I don't think you got to do all of that. He needed to do it. Boy, he got God's attention. He was a priest, his direct descendant of Aaron. But he wasn't a high priest. He was just one of the priests that got to minister in the presence of the Lord. And he was so earnest about having the glory come back. You know, he was one of the first people that was allowed by God to be a part of the revival, true revival. A real, a real revival is where God's people return back to that which he gave them in the first place. To get, they get back to the miracle inheritance that he provides for us, that he's given to us freely. I love how uh, the Apostle Paul describes salvation. He, say, he says, not by any works of righteousness which we are we have done, but we are saved by the washing of the water of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I mean, such a radical grace that God has, has brought us into because of his great love for us. We hear Zechariah as he cries out. Of course, if you don't know the scripture, I just quoted Titus 3, 5. Zechariah cries out in, in Luke chapter 2. One, and, and, and verse 76, starting verse 76, and goes to crescendo in 78, where he starts back 74, but comes to a great crescendo in 78. He says, now, we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. He's not talking about the Roman Empire. He's, had a, he's, he's, been, he's been in the presence of the Lord. He was just going about the course of ministry, doing the service of ministry. They had not seen the glory. Listen, they didn't see the glory like this. Read about it. God did some wonderful things under the administration of Ezra and Nehemiah as they led in revival. They had Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi standing alongside of them prophesying on behalf of the purposes of God to strengthen them. These are radical guys. They were saying, look, man, we've got to get God back into our lives. We've got to get God back into our midst. You guys who married strange women, you got to divorce them. you got to send them away. you got to send away your children. We're going to have to be a consecrated people unto God. And we don't see the Lord saying, time out. Because they were actually getting this from the Bible. They were reading the Word of God going, my goodness, we've messed up bad. Surely, we, surely we're going to incur the wrath again because we're not being willing to be what He's called us to be. He's called us to be a transcendent other. He's called us to be something so different than everything that is expressed within the system of the world. That's something that is foreign to people. 
They don't understand that the holiness of God is defined by his otherness. He's just defined by his total separateness. He's totally distinctively different. He's isolated. I mean, he's so isolated, and you begin to be, understand it within, within the framework of how he set bounds around the mountain and said, nobody, nothing, no animal, nothing comes here. I'm here now. And then we see how that, then that, that separateness of God which is another word for sanctification or consecration, that separateness of God is contained in with the, with inside of the kadosh kodashim or the holiness of holinesses. And then he sanctifies one person to be able, he gives them a special ability and a special grace to be able to step into the realm which he himself dwells in and exists in and he will not be contaminated with the vermin the impurity that is laid upon a victim that would ultimately be able to swallow up the, the, you know, sop up, as it were, the death and the sin and the iniquity which the sacrifice and the Levitical offerings basically are, are describing, which ultimately Jesus did for us when he bore our sins in his own body on the tree so that we now being dead unto sin might live unto righteousness. That's radical, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. You know, it used to be in the church that if you wanted, if you wanted to receive a confirmation by the church leadership, you had to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ was Lord and that had to be explained and expressed within the context that he is indeed the eternal God who was made flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's the kind of confession that used to be essential before you ever got anything like baptism or communion, before anybody ever said, uh, brought you into the community of the church because th this was a part of really uh, th the examination, if you would. That you would believe in your, you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that a resurrection of the dead took place. A resurrection of the dead that's not just apart from us. A resurrection of the dead that we have been entrusted in Christ Jesus to participate with. If you then be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above. Colossians chapter 3. We coming back over here to Romans 10.10 10 for just a moment. Listen to this. To confess with your mouth, to believe in your heart in an event of resurrection, transformation of life, really. That washing of the water regeneration, you talk about a detergent. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus Christ, the kippur, it is a detergent. It is, it is not, um, kippur should never be translated to cover. Kippur means to pure a gate. It's a purification to purify on a level that no other detergent can match. And now, you know, now that we become, we, we you know, we've had so much more ability to explore cousin languages to Hebrew like Eucharist and Akkadian. We understand Kippur like never before. It's time people catch up here because Kippur is always used in the Eucharist language as a detergent. And that is as close as you can get to Hebrew. I mean, it's closer than Chaldean. Aramaic and Aramaic is pretty close if you speak Hebrew and read Hebrew you can speak Aramaic and read Aramaic and they share so many words but bottom line of it is just think about this this purification this ability to purigate to sop up all of the wickedness and all of the sin within that was contained within the whole of Israel in a sacrifice that represented Christ Jesus who would come and live and die on our behalf who would come and bear all of our sins to take the sin of the whole world upon himself so that the whole vermin of impurity and to be slaughtered in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover sacrifice, the exact time. <laughs> and then the Lord takes it to another level and says, we've been washed with the water of regeneration. That is a whole nother level of purification. That's a whole nother level of Kippur. That's a whole never think about it. Washing of water, regeneration. And when if you understand, if you if you're studying the Greek language, if you're not, you should. Because it's not that hard. Now we got all these, you got all these study aids. If you want to buy somebody, you know, that loves the Lord and loves to study his word, 
a good present by them Logos Scholar Library because you, you just <laughs> click and, <laughs> and point and, you know, my goodness, and you get, you know, just a whole list of various different great scholarly uh, references on, on studying the Word of God. But, you know, the bottom line of it is when you look at these, these words like regeneration, it's to actually receive an entirely different genome. It's to actually be created all over again. It's like to step in the in this in this in this in this, you know, in a generator and be, you know, in this in this this thing, this container, as it were, and be completely every cell of your body may, may be made different, be made new, a regeneration. See, the reality of it is, it's the cornerstone of faith. It's the cornerstone of salvation. It's the cornerstone. When G, when when look, when you be, I hear many people talk about faith and they talk about justification by faith well if you're going to stand justification by faith then you're going to have to understand the scripture which it was which was paul's cornerstone on the ministry of justification of faith was habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and he says the righteous hallelujah shall live by their absolute trust in god amen hallelujah hey they, they, this is a trust relationship look at what happened look at what happened with abraham when he trusted god to that extent look at where ultimately that trust that he would not withhold anything any father, anything father said even if father said something that sounded like the religion of the amalekites go and take now your son and sacrifice him upon an altar and nothing god said he wasn't going to do he's radical so trusting god that he ultimately becomes the father of faith he ultimately steps into this privilege to now be the ancestor of the messiah i mean to be the ancestor of god incarnate in flesh to be the ancestor of god taking on the human human frame i mean that is amazing to be heir of the worlds to come found in trusting god and this trust ultimately that is the springboard of the supernatural work of divine grace where god allows us to participate in a miraculous event of being born again <laughs> a lot of people don't realize this but a part a big part of the great awakening that took place beginning really in the 1730s and the 1740s especially as it was you know advanced by George Whitfield was because George Whitfield stepped into a revelation he stepped into a revelation I want you to listen to this revelation. It's going to shock you. He's in Oxford. He's a, he's a part of what's called the Holy Club that was started by John and Charles Wesley. Okay? And he's out basically walking the campus one day, just out in the park-like area of the campus at, at Oxford. And suddenly, he happened upon the verse of Scripture in John chapter 3 as Jesus is discussing salvation and what it means to come into the faith and what it means uh, to have this wonderful work of grace in their lives. And he saw in that Scripture that a man must be born again. And that was absolutely a revelation. The Anglican church was far away from it. They were still stuck in the religion uh, that, that engulfed them from Roman Catholicism, the religious ritual that held them in such bondage. It was not something that is apparent to, uh, as it is now. And what happened was he went everywhere preaching this revelation. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. And when he would start talking about being born of the Spirit, people would come under an influence that would shake them to the core, he, he, there would be people. I mean, you, got, you had folks that we know, like Benjamin Franklin was actually in those meetings. I, I'm sure that other, I mean, we know that Benjamin Franklin was in those meetings because he actually testified in his memoirs that he was in the meetings of George Whitfield. I'm sure that the other framers of the Constitution were also impacted by those meetings. He was having meetings right there in the big middle of everything on, on, you know, in Pennsylvania where everybody was gathering together and there was a formation of some great event where the, the, this thing that the scholars today would say is an event that takes place every 3,000 years where all of a sudden men had this great genius to form the kind of uh, of, of government that we now and have been for in over 200 years enjoying. And it wasn't really the brilliance of men. It was an act of God's divine grace. Because we had a bunch of people praying and crying out to God. Most of the leaders, political leaders of that day were preachers. <laughs> if they weren't preachers, they were church leaders. They were lay preachers. I mean, think about, this is the formation of who 
who we are and what God has done to bless us. And, and we, we crossed, uh, we went past, we went past a divine moment, a divine opportunity not too long ago. And, and, and we said that God is no, I mean, our leaders, we didn't say it, but our leaders that we empower have a, hum, a, a tremendous effect upon us. And they, they say, we no longer a Christian nation. We embracing all these religions. Well, what they didn't realize was they were also saying, Lord, we don't want your protection or your provision either. And so we're doing our best to get people ready. But I truly believe this is an opportunity for there to be a great moving of God. Because I'm telling you, for I, I, I still see, I still see, I don't just, I don't just, I do not just see a great falling away. I know there will come a great apostasy. And I know that that can only be understood within the framework of the church. It can't be, apostasy can't be referred to in the framework of the world. Because there's no way for them to apostate. They're already in a state that is, that is opposite and other than God. But I know that right now, we are here in... San Diego, California, Southern California, where seven, at least you could say, at least six great denominations. I mean, the Pentecostal holiness movement of the late 1800s. You know, Brazil, I can name so many different people. You know, I can, you know, <laughs> the list goes on. A.B. Simpson, so many different people influenced by what happened here. And then you had, you had a great shaking take place, 1906, and, a, and a, a, a birth of a brand new, fresh revival and move of God that so shook the, the whole of the world. It shook the world. Listen, it did. Somebody said it wasn't God. It shook the world. Come on. It shook the world. It changed the landscape of Christianity. It shook the world. It was God. My goodness. And out of that comes, you know, the movement of the Assemblies of God by 1916. Also, Bartleman started United Pentecostal Church Jesus Only, which, you know, we're not real proud of, but I'm telling you, there's some holy people of God in that place. There's some radical rascals in that place, too, but, and there's radical rascals everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Bartleman just, he just, you know, he just got influenced by the wrong folks, trying to understand, trying to understand the Trinity. I was with one of the, one of the leaders of the United Pentecostal Church Jesus Only, United Pentecostal Church, uh, in July this year. And he's a great man of God. If you know Tommy Tenney, Tommy Tenney and, his, and all his family comes to the United Pentecostal Jesus suddenly. Great man of God. You know, you don't have to agree on everything. But I was standing there talking to this, this great church leader. He's, he's a great church leader. And I said, you know, it is just, it's just so amazing how that the Lord did not leave us into the realm of our intellect to try to figure out this beautiful miracle that he's designed for us. He told us to experience it. And he's standing there looking at me as I'm talking. And I said, just, you know, isn't it beautiful to consider in John 17, verse 21, when Jesus says to the Father, Father, the glory you gave to me, I'm giving it to them. The Father, just like you're in me, <laughs> I'm going to be in them. And so, Father, you and me and I and them that they may be made perfect in one to literally get to experience just how it is that Father is one with Jesus. How Jesus is one with Father. How that Jesus says, I'm going to send you another one just like me. He's the Holy Ghost. I love talking about the Holy Spirit and I'm trying to get there. But I'm, I've got to take all these various different routes because I never know. I, I really don't plan what I'm going to do. I just get over here in expectation to flow. To, I, I, I'm in expectation for the, what some people call the rapture, catching away. I'm, I'm expectation. My, my belt's on. And I got my lamp, and I'm ready to go. I'm in expectation. I want to have an encounter with God. I'm not here to be just a churchman, even though my ancestry goes back in churchmen uh, for, for many generations. I'm not here to be a churchman. I'm here to ultimately grab a hold of all those things that Jesus made available to us to see this nation shake, shaken by the power of God once again. This nation, it was literally born in revival. It was born in the revival of somebody talking about the work of the Holy Ghost. A miracle work where you become a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything is new. Have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. 
and he'll change everything about you. As the prophet said, he'll give you a new heart and he'll give you a new spirit and he'll put his spirit on the inside of you. I won't, well, I, won't, I won't be with you as I was when I took you by the hand, led you up, up out of the land of Egypt, but I'll walk in you. I'll live in you. I'll write my laws upon your mind, upon your heart. Begin to conceptualize this relationship. I mean, me, me and this dear brother, we just stood there. We stood there reveling in the words of Jesus, just touched by the presence of God, not arguing about doctrine. Actually, that's not doc doctrine. Doctrine is actually the teachings of God by the Holy Ghost. Paul said, if I come speaking unto you, you speaking, if I come to you speaking in tongues, why shall it profit you? Now, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6. If I come speaking in tongues, what shall it profit you? Lest I speak also by revelation, by knowledge, by prophecy, and by doctrine. Okay? That's not the Strong's Exhausted Concordance. And you do word studies. Huh? And then, or Google them, either one. Or whatever it is that you do. And then write out. This is the teachings of the Holy Ghost by the Spirit. Hallelujah. There's got to be a breaking forth of the divine power and glory of God in our life. That's the way Father designed it. Yeah, I mean, goodness. If, if Peter can't go and do the gospel program, if he can't go preach right until he first gets baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, how much more are you and I, dear people? I mean, Jesus, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But first, go to Jerusalem and tarry and wait. I believe that the Pentecostal movement had it more right before the, before the 60s. I'm just telling you. Before the 60s. <laughs> there was no, you know, there was no teaching anybody how to speak in tongues. Before the 60s. You tarried. In the Pentecostal movement, you tarried. First and foremost, you, you, left, you stepped into the spotlight of heaven. You let God begin to talk to you. You begin to consecrate. You begin to, take, you, know, you begin to take the steps in every way to say, I'm going to live this separate life. I'm going to come out from among them, be separate, as the Lord has said, so that he can be my God and I can be his people. Amen. I'm not going to touch the unclean thing. I'm going to live a pure life because he's, uh, he's, he's consecrated me. And I'm going I'm to take hold of this, this realm of sanctification. I mean, you've been... Oh. You know, we have now we have television that can go and take the gospel to the four, <laughs> to the every, I was going to say the four winds, to every city and town really pretty much in the world, even in the backwoods of Egypt, which you talk about, it's back, you talk about backwards. They're 2,000 years backwards. I mean, they still dress like they did 2,000 years ago. These people are backwards. But many, they got televisions. And televisions, you can see, you can see, unfortunately, much of what we're piping out of the United States of America. You don't hear, you don't hear people talk about sanctification, the, the ministry of being consecrated, the ministry of being separated on him, the ministry of understanding what Jesus said, you're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. He says, you're not of the world. You're not of the world. What does that mean? That means that you've been set apart and brought over into another realm in which Father himself dwells. You and I have been brought over into the holies of holies with him. He, the holies of holies moved on the inside of us. The Holy Ghost come and live on the inside of us. Jesus said, if you obey me, my Father, and I come, my Father and I will come and dwell with you. John chapter 14, verse 24. Think about that. If anywhere Father is going to be is the holies of holies. He's not going to be outside the holies of holies. He's not going to be outside of the Kadosh Kadoshim. Now, I want to show you just real quickly. I mean, I know I'm all over the map, and I've got a lot of loose sins I need to collect. I've left you hanging on several different stories. You know, I, got, I, I may come back to them. I mean, I should, especially George Whitfield and the formation of this nation and what was being taught and a cry that was coming out of preachers' hearts to return to the Lord, to separate themselves unto God, to pursue a divine purpose for which they believe and saw the United States of America existed for. Under Andy Jackson was the second great, the second great awakening under Andy, President Andy Jackson, led primarily by Charles Finney and Father Nash. I just think about these guys now. Huh? You think about the mirrored effect that it had on the liberties of this nation. Go and look at all of the liberties that was extended to everybody in this nation on the administration of Andy Jackson. You didn't have to be a landowner anymore to vote. You could just be any poor person. You could just be a citizen of the United States of America. You could vote. Lots of, there's a lots of things. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because it was a great moving of God. A great moving of God can save this 
world again. But you know, it can save this nation again. Can turn this nation back. But that's that great moving of God has to start in you and me. It ain't going to start in them. And you, know, you could say all you want, Father, rend the heavens and come down. He's already done that, and he's here. And he's dealing with your heart, and he's dealing with my heart, and he's saying, are you going to walk right? Are you going to do right? Are you going to represent me? Are you going to let me live in you? Are you going to let me do my work through you? Are you going to, let me, are you going to allow my glory to flow through you? You cannot be my witnesses until first you endued with power from on high. And that, that's not going to be a reality unless we want to just totally give ourselves over to the leadership. Of the Holy Spirit. God wants to show us how to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of holiness. Hmm. God wants to show us how to walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to teach us. To lead us. To guide us. To live by the Spirit. A place where you make no provision for the flesh. To fulfill the lust of it. A place where you and I can walk in a greater realm of divine glory. Than Elisha ever had an opportunity to walk in. When he grabbed a hold of the mantle of Elijah. Because now you and I have given the, been given the ministry of Jesus Christ. Who, who has come to live and abide and dwell on the inside of us. To give, he's given to us the, the privilege to be co-laborers together with him. To be heirs of God and co-inheritors with him. To not be like little children anymore, but be sons. It's the whole message of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4. The message of salvation. The washing of water. The washing of the water of regeneration. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's how... Paul defined, that's how he defined salvation. People need to say deliverance. People are calling folks to salvation. No, you need to stop. Call people to repentance because there needs to be a change. People just think they can come as they are. You cannot. God calls you as you are to change you. Huh? Oh, he's going to accept me like he is, like I am. No, he's not. He's going to call you like you are to change you. He demands a change. And it's a miracle change. It's a change where you and I receive a perfect heart. Ha, we receive a new heart. Ha, ha. And where we can say, I believe in my heart unto righteousness. I don't believe. With my mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with my heart, I believe unto righteousness. So then we begin to join now with Zechariah in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Oh, now having been delivered out of the hand of our enemies, we can now serve God in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. I mean, it was exciting to them. It wasn't like a drudgery. I know nobody can do that. I start talking to people about the freedom that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. And a whole slew of folks come behind me and start talking about the bondage that we now have in Christ Jesus. I say that the obedience to Jesus has far greater effect than the disobedience of Adam. I say the righteousness of Christ Jesus has far greater effect than the unrighteousness and the iniquity and the darkness and the sinfulness and the death that was incurred because of what Adam did when he transgressed. If there's anything God's people need to hear is this. Receive the life of Jesus. To receive the life of Jesus. It's time to receive the life of Jesus. He wants to come and step into our lives. When he steps into our lives, I mean, what he did when he sanctified us by his own self. When he sanctified us with his blood. When he sanctified us first and foremost with the Holy Spirit. Being now sanctified by the Spirit. Huh? Is that, who does that sound like? Sounds like the Apostle Peter. That's who it sounds like, doesn't it? Now being sanctified by the Spirit. Look at, look at Exodus chapter 30 verse 29. What God did. I, I want you to understand. I hear people say, well, the anointing is for the purpose of going to signs, wonders, and miracles. That is true in part, but that's not the first part, okay? I said that's true in part, but that's not the first part. The anointing was given to sanctify. The anointing was given. It was rubbed all over you to separate you, to give you an imparted grace, a divine ability to stand in a holy place. Not only human beings were sanctified and rubbed down with the oil of God, which rep a special oil that could be no, there could be no, uh, nothing uh, made like unto this particular oil. Couldn't smell like this. It couldn't, it couldn't be fashioned in any way uh, after this recipe that the Lord had given. And that anointing oil that represents the Holy Ghost that comes upon us. The Holy Spirit that has now come and touched the hearts of every man everywhere. There's pleading with men everywhere to come. 
And then ultimately when we respond, works a miracle. That anointing, we have received an anointing from him. And do not need that any man teach us. But that same anointing that we have received from him teaches us all things that we should abide in Christ. Eh? Huh? You know where that is? You know I'm not making this up. First John 2, what? Giving out prizes tonight. 29, right? It's, I, I, I want you to grab a hold of this anointing. This anointing was given for the purpose of separating us so that we could walk into a place of holiness of holinesses. Look at what it says there. You got the Bible open there? Who has their Bible open there? So I can read your Bible just a minute. I like to get this right. This is King James here. This will be just fine. And you shall sanctify them that they may, may be kadosh kodashim. If I was reading out the Hebrew Bible, I would say kadosh kodashim, which means to be holiness of holinesses. A terminology that belonged only for the holies of holies. You shall sanctify them. You shall set them apart. And he's talking about putting this holy anointing oil upon them. The rub down that they're getting. The representation of that which you and I receive miraculously by the person of the Holy Ghost himself. By the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, think about it. Jesus comes and anoints us. So I said, my, it would have been wonderful. I've been in the days of of, of, of Samuel, and he would have come in and put the holy anointing oil upon me. Well, only one person got that. And everybody else is left out. But now the Spirit of the Lord has been poured out upon all flesh. What an amazing grace. What an amazing, what great riches, what great gifts God has given to us. And we haven't even begun to understand the fashion of them. Or to benefit from them as we ought. And oh, God wants to teach us. And he's the only one who can teach us. And we got to come to his school. we got to live in his school. God gave us the most precious gifts he has. He gave us the eternal word which was hid in his bosom. Ah, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. He's the maker. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't know where that is, it's John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Hinting on verse 3. Huh? He, he brought, he get, what a gift. I mean, it would have been just, just been beautiful if, if God just gave us the gift. And if Jesus, God, he was incarnated in the flesh. Emmanuel came to live with us. And he just was here. You know, when we get to go to look at what it's like to be him. <laughs> to be a person who, who lives in the heavenly realm. Who lives in the fullness of everything that God has. I mean, you know, Enoch waved to us from that realm. It's not just a story. It's somebody who touched the realm of heaven and is waving to us and saying, this is what it's like over here. And the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. This is Enoch. He's so pleased with the Lord that the Lord took him. Huh? He's been standing in the presence of the Lord. My. He's been there now for something, you know, close to what? Almost... 4,500 years or so. Elijah was taken out. He's been there standing in the presence of the Lord for about 2,600 years, alive in the presence of the Lord, just waving at us from a heavenly realm. Elijah's standing over there in that divine power and that divine glory, waving at us, saying, hey, you can live over here in this place. Moses is waving at us, saying, you can live over here. Joshua is waving at us. All of the saints of God are waving at us and saying, hey, there's another realm to live in. Father and now has made an opportunity so that all can come in. I mean, there should be a rush on the door. The door is Jesus to rush into the kingdom of God, to be over here in this place where darkness no more has power over us. This place of communion and fellowship that Satan fights with everything he has to blind the hearts and minds of men so that they cannot see the beauty of this fellowship. John was able to see, said, he was able to say, our eyes have seen and our hands have handled the word of life. Huh? We've laid hold on that eternal life which was with the Father. See, the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us and now we can reveal him or we reveal him or show him or manifest him unto you. First John chapter 1 verses 1 through 2. One through two. Huh? This is an opportunity that you have and I know what's going on. I know what happens. All the doubt. All the doubt. 
Oh, can it truly be? I mean, we're like Peter, you know, before Pentecost. We're like Peter. We're like looking at the grave, and we're looking at tomb rolled away, the stone rolled away, and we're going, can it be? Is it possible? And then we go, and we actually then, you know, have an encounter with him on the road to, of Emmaus. Huh? <laughs> Did not our hearts burn within us? I mean, you know, and he's revealed to us through the breaking of bread. And, and still what we do, we go fishing. We go fishing. And he goes looking for us. And where does he find us? Fishing. Fishing. That's what you do when you're not feeling, when you're kind of depressed. You go fishing. <laughs> trying to feel better. Trying to get a break. Fishing. Children, have you any meat? No. We caught nothing. Bayonet on the other side. It's the master. He jumps overboard. He doesn't wait to he doesn't wait to get the sail up. Pull the anchor in. He jumps overboard. Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. Go manifest my glory. Go manifest what you know about me. Look, Peter, you love me. You know all things, Father. Why do you ask again? You know all things, Lord Jesus. Forgive me. Why do you ask again? You know everything, Lord. Do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. Now, go tarry in Jerusalem to you and do with power from on high. Remember what John said? Surely he said, I baptize you with water, but there's coming one who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus talking about himself, Acts 1.5. I love to hear Jesus talk about himself. I love to hear Jesus talk about who he is. Talk about his ministry. I mean, this is the resurrected Jesus talking about his ministry. This is what I'm going to do with the church. The church is born in the fires of Pentecost. It's in the fires when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The day when God, uh, Exodus chapter 19, spoke with an audible voice from Mount Sinai. And all the people trembled and shook and thought that they were going to die having heard his voice while Moses just stood there, you know, raptured in the glory saying, I want more. You know, this is Moses. I want more. Everybody else is hiding behind the rock screaming. <laughs> Moses, you go talk to him. Tell us what he says. I'm afraid that there might be too many people like that today. And, and we're going to have to rise up and take a hold of the power and the grace of God if we're going to see a breakthrough. There's going to have to come. It doesn't take many people. 120 people changed the world. They brought down the idols, the idolatry. They brought down the cultures that had held men in bondage for more than 2,000 years, steeped in great iniquity. Ephesus would be one example. The worshiping of, the great, of what they called the great goddess Diana, Artem, Artemis, or, es, or Esther. She had other names, too, known as the Queen of Heaven. One preacher, St. Patrick, walks in. Of course, I'm St. Mark, and you're St. whatever your name is. You are, because that's what, that's what the Lord made us. I, I, I'm constantly having to stop and make sure everybody understands these things. <laughs> Don't canonize him any more than you canonize yourself, if you would. And, of course, that would be an improper term to apply to Bow. Are you with me? you understand? He walks in and with one, in just one sermon, brings down the, the idolatry and the power of the religion of the Druids and liberates Ireland. With one sermon, one, one, one day, a, a little slave girl from Cappadocia is taken into Georgia. And one little slave girl, full of the Holy Ghost, Changes the whole nation, and Georgia becomes the first Christian nation of that region in the second century. One slave girl. You know how that happened? Because back in those days, if your child fell sick, you would go from door to door in the culture, and you would see if anybody could recognize the disease. That is how they diagnosed the disease. And perhaps somebody would say, oh, yeah, I recognize that. Give her, you know, this and that and the other thing. That should be fine. Well, she, he, this, th they happen on the right door. And this little slave girl, girl comes to the door. And she says, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ to be healed. She, and then it came into the ears of the queen who had been uh, sick. You can go Google this. It's, if you don't know this, is it, this, this is our history. This is in the history of the church. Huh? It comes to the ears of the queen who had been diseased. One of, her, one of her servants told her about what was going on and how it was rumored concerning this baby that was almost dead. And a slave girl lays her hands on him and she recovers from her sickness. And she goes and she prays for the queen. The queen gets totally healed in Jesus' name. 
There's the power of the name of Jesus. These signs shall follow them that believe. Imagine being in that church with that, uh, those 120 which are mostly family and cousins and people who have been hanging right out with Jesus from the very beginning. That's mostly what ended up at Pentecost. Just a small group of people. When all of a sudden we hear the audible voice of God not coming from a mountain that no one could touch. The, Moses said, the sight of it caused me to tremble deeply. I exceedingly quaked. I quaked on the inside of me. It was so awesome, so glorious. And he was, it, it, you think about this, knowing the terror of the Lord, but I want more. You know, it's a radical thing, experiencing the love of God and the awesomeness of his power all at the same time. It, it, there's no emotion known to the human condition like this. You have to have an encounter with him. And the beautiful thing of it is he wants to have an encounter with us. We just got to want it more than anything else. We got to want it enough to say no to all the other stuff. He meets us. He comes to us in our sin and our iniquity. He comes to us in all of our unworthiness and all of our mess and guile and unforgiveness. And he wraps his arms around us and he loves us and he hugs us and he gives us this free gift of salvation. All we got to do is just say, please, Jesus, save me. He saves us. And then he wants now to teach us the ways of the Lord. And we get stuck. He wants to teach us. He wants to lead us into all the goodness that he has prepared for us. That he has opened the door. Provision for us to have. It's time the church turn around. It's time the church wake up. It has to be an awakening. Awakening has to come. Awakening. God's people are sleeping. There has to be an awakening. There has to be a revival that turns us back to our inheritance. Our inheritance is a place where we're living in God and God's living in us. Huh? Where we're fellowshipping with Him, where we know Him. Imagine being around this company of people, everybody that surrounds you. Huh? Whoa, everybody that surrounds you. They're doing signs, wonders, and miracles. Why? Because Jesus is on the inside of them doing signs, wonders, and miracles. Are they all hooked on doing signs, wonders, and miracles? No, they're hooked on Jesus. And Jesus does signs, wonders, and miracles. They're all full of the Holy Ghost. They're all endued with power. They got the provision for people who are demon-possessed. They got the provision for people who are sick and diseased and tormented in their mind and depressed. And salvation comes as a full package. When there's that kind of an atmosphere of faith, we don't live in that atmosphere of faith. We live more like in a, in a place like Nazareth, where everybody's just really religious. And I tell you right now, I, I know some folks that, that would just... Blow everybody away when it comes to quoting the scripture, but they know nothing about the Holy Spirit. They're, they're ultra-Orthodox Jews that, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time studying with just so I can learn the language better. You can ask them one of the, one of the verb forms in the Hebrew language, and they'll just sit there and tell you where every scripture starting in Genesis all the way to Second Chronicles where it's found. Pretty radical. Devoted to the word. Devoted just, it's what they do all day. The brilliant mind who could go and make all kinds of money and be this and that, be a doctor, be a lawyer, whatever. No, he just dedicated us, he was dedicated to all day. All day. All day. Man, if we could just get God's people to start reading a little bit. I'm, I, I think it's a breakthrough to show people that in 90 days you can read the whole Bible and only spend less than an hour a day doing it. That's a revelation in our day uh, uh, where we're at right now. That's a revelation. Somebody said, oh, give me, I had people all the time. Oh, give me the 90-day program that you have. Okay, are you ready? Take the total number of pages in your Bible. And divide them by 90. Read that many pages a day. You'll spend less than 45 minutes huh, with an average reading speed. That means that 20 minutes in the morning, basically, 20 minutes before you go to bed, and your whole life will be changed. You read the Bible four times a a year. If there's anything people need to do in this day and time is they need to stop listening to all the preachers preaching and stop reading all the books and all the commentaries and just start reading the Bible because I'm telling you right now, Father, the Holy Ghost has come under the direction of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to lead us and to teach us. I'm going to tell you right now, when you got the Bible open and you're reading continually, Father will start putting his finger on stuff in your life. He'll start he'll, he'll jump up off the page and start changing you. The Word of God will start working effectually in you. But if, you're just, if it's just there gathering dust, if it's just there and you're spot checking every once in a while, huh? you're trying to get in, you know, five minutes every once in a while, and it's just a glance. There's no real commitment. There's no real commitment. 
God separated you for himself. Jesus' blood was poured out so that you could be separated unto God to live where he lives. The grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men has come so that you and I could be separated now to begin to be taught by the Holy Spirit himself, the spirit of holiness, who came and gave us a special learning ability that before we didn't have. Because before, we were in darkness and with blindness of heart and mind, and none of us had the capacity to know or understand. We were all stupid. We're all ignorant. We couldn't learn. We had a learning disorder. Huh? We did. And, and, he, and the Lord said that, that we wouldn't be, you know, Paul would describe it as, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, says it's foolishness to the natural man, cannot be understood by the natural man. And so the Lord came and made us a spiritual man. Hallelujah. You're born of the Spirit. You're born of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of holiness, who's now given to you anointing that you may know him. Given to you a divine miracle act of grace so that you may be one with him. So that you're in him and he's in you. So that, so that he comes and makes his dwelling on the inside of you. So that you are called literally the temple of the Holy Ghost. I read about Ahab and I get upset. I can't imagine how Father would forgive him after all that he did. Then read about Manasseh, and then he was worse. And what he did to Judah, the southern kingdom. And I'm even more upset. How could you do that? Put two idols, two altars, build two altars to two deities, form literally images of demons, and command Israel, Judah, the southern kingdom, to bow down and worship them. Build two altars to these profane gods and put them in the holies of holies. Put them in the temple of God in the holies of holies. Listen to me now. Send his children down into the valley of Hinnom so that they may be burned in the fire under the deities. And God forgave him. Father, how can you do that? How can you do that? And then he, then he turns back and looks at us and says, well, look at what I've been forgiving you over. Because how many, we thought God made us his temple. You can try to put that in whatever terminology and language you are comfortable with. <laughs> and a lot of people aren't comfortable going really all the way with that. But where he, Christ, has come to live and to dwell on the inside. Father has come to live and abide on the inside of us. Jesus saying, come dwell with me. Come, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Have this life, my life. Eternal life is the life of God by definition. It's not some other kind of life. It's not some kind of special kind of life. It's the life that Jesus Christ himself has. The life that Father, Yehovah, has. The life of the Holy Spirit. The life. His life. A life that is filled with every good, perfect thing. Every wonderful and holy emotion. Oh Lord, strengthen us in our soul that we desire only, that we would love only you, desire only holy emotions, and seek only those pleasures that are at your right hand. Oh God, strengthen us in our spirit that we would hate iniquity and sin. And he has, he's come to strengthen us, come to teach us. And then when we think about how he's made so much provision for us. So that the blood of Jesus would cleanse us if we sin. My goodness. How often? As often as you need. Seven times 70 is a Hebrew idiom that means as much as you need. Whatever you need. It's, somebody says 490 times. It's more than that. It's seven times 70. It's all that you could ever want. So I'll forgive you that much. But you can't, you can't build an altar in your heart to covetousness. You can't build an altar in your heart to worldliness. God's made us separate from the world. I mean, I, I quote sometimes the scripture in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and people think I'm quoting the Old Testament. Come out from among them, be them separate. Be separate, says God. Oh, that's for the Amish. No. That's for everyone. Come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, and I shall receive you. What, what, what do you mean, receive me? Now I shall be your God and you shall be my people. Oh. Father, Father has gone to great expense so that we could be delivered out of the hand of our enemy. 
someone far worse than a Haman and far greater than a Mordecai and Esther. Some a tor- uh, uh, one who just would destroy us and, and bring an end to our existence. Far worse than a Haman has been defeated by our intercessor who's far greater than Mordecai and Esther, Christ Jesus, our intercessor. The Lord looked and said, there was no one to take up the get, yeah, to take up the hitch. I mean, Father, Father, there's one point, Father has one champion in the earth. One champion, Job. Have you ever studied the doctrines of Job? It's good doctrines for the most part. It's good doctrines are just misapplied. It happens all the time. You understand what I'm saying? Good doctrines just misapplied. They didn't know what was going on behind the scenes of Job. They didn't understand that God said, I got a man. God, Satan said, he'll curse you. He'll curse you. See, Satan, Satan, Satan believes, he believes that all men hate God. He believes that all men want to do exactly what he did. He's trying to convince God that God's wrong. He's rebellious. He's a pathological liar. Somebody says he's defeated. Yeah, he is, but he don't know it. I, mean, I can show you he's going to have two uprisings to, yet to come. One you find in the middle of the tribulation about Revelation chapter 12, and then one after a thousand years of reign with Christ Jesus. People, there's going to have to be somebody who's set apart unto God so Father can bring forth the glory of his salvation through them. You hear me? Somebody, listen to me. Somebody. There had to be a people separated unto God so Father could bring forth his holy child Jesus through. So that the Holy Ghost could come upon a virtuous woman whose heart was set apart to that which belonged to the ways of the kingdom of God, who wasn't filled with all kinds of demonic influences. God made a provision for them to remain clean from evil spirits. He did. There had to be a Mary. There had to be a Mary. Who could, who could be sensitive enough to the Lord so that the Gabriel, the archangel, could come and say, Mary highly favored of the Lord. And then tell her about how the, the ho- power of the Holy Ghost was going to come upon her and overshadow her. Huh? How the power of the Almighty would come upon her and overshadow her and that holy thing that would be conceived on the inside of her by the power of the Holy Ghost. Huh? Amazing, eh? Be called the Son of God. Amazing work of grace, the working power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus stepped in this world by way of a miracle birth. You and I have stepped into his realm by way of a miracle birth. Jesus became everything that we are and bore our sins, all of our sins, took on all of our sins. Became the sin offering for us, sin offering. Cut hot offering, sin offering. It is a misnomer to say sin. If you did the same thing in the Old Testament, you'd be totally confused. You'd understand what I mean. So yeah, I think people misunderstand. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It became the sin offering. The chatat is a sin offering. Not just the sin. It's a sin offering. So chatat is never just sin. There's another word for that. It's a sin offering. So that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Paul, who? According to the law, according to the righteousness which of the law found himself blameless, having kept it all. You look at you look at the rich man, and Jesus starts talking to the rich man. He says, "Lord, I've I've done all these things from my youth." He says, "You only lack one thing." Jesus says, "You only lack one thing." That's a pretty radical message, isn't it? It's a pretty radical doctrine. Go sell all that you have. Come follow me. Go sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. Huh? He says of Job, I got a perfect man, upright in all of his ways. You know, Satan says, no, he, he's, he doesn't serve you for nothing. He blessed him. That's what, that's good doctrine. Satan knows it. You, you walk with God, he's going to bless you. Huh? Listen to all the counselors of Job. They recognize, you. they're trying to convince Job, that somewhere he was a hypocrite. He was been sneaking around. They all thought he was such a righteous, holy man. And now it's you, you, the floodlight of heaven's now shining on you. We all know you've been hanky pinking in the background. Huh? He says, no, I haven't. You don't understand. He said, miserable comfor- co- comforters all you, right? He said, nobody will take my uprightness from me. Wow. 
Wow. I know that my Redeemer lives. So long as I have breath in my being. Huh? My heart will not condemn me. I just get rid of that finish that scripture. He goes on to say, I know that my Redeemer lives and shall stand upon the earth in the last days. And no worm should eat my flesh. Yet my body shall arise up out of the earth. Hallelujah. Somebody said, uh, try, people, try to teach soul sleeping from the book of Job. I said, come on, man. You can't. Come on. It was one of the great revelations of the resurrection of, of the righteous is in the book of Job. Oh, people, God is going, wants to show forth his glory through our lives. There's got to be another awakening. There's got to be another great moving of God in the midst of us. There's got to be another group of people that are going to begin to seek God's face. I mean, you know, I think about back to, back to the Azusa Street Revival and birth of the Assemblies of God Church. And when the Nazarene Church had already started, and it was Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene at that time. Now, Brzee was offended by tongues. And, the, and when Brzee got offended by tongues in, in 07, 1907, he got offended by tongues. He went, saw what was going on, getting offended by it. The whole movement, the whole Pentecostal church of the Nazarene movement changed radically. It was different. It was totally different. They were the noisy rings. They were the people who stood, who cried out for God and, 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 and prayed till the glory came and then stood in the glory. That's who they were. It was a radical holiness movement. It's Pentecostal holiness movement. Right here. Right in Pasadena. Pasadena. The holiness movements of the late 1800s. Right in Pasadena. Affected the whole world. Assemblies of God. Then the, great, the new Pentecostal Church of God movement that came out of that split in 1916. Then... Amy Simple McPherson, which, you know, people, once again, greeted by the reproach because people did things wrong. But still, I mean, the four square churches touched the world. The four square churches touched the world. The list goes on. Calvary Chapel. You know, I, I, I just jump ahead because I'm going to go through all. Calvary Chapel. And, you know, when I look back in, at the beginnings of Calvary Chapel, you know, I think Calvary Chapel, I think Captain Coleman. People don't think that way anymore because they're so removed from it. But that's where it was going on. That's where Lonnie was at. That's where Chuck, uh, Pastor Chuck was at. <laughs> they were hanging out in those meetings. And then I know about the offense. I know what happened. And then all of a sudden people start pulling away. And then Vineyard. Calvary Chapels, Calvary Chapels touched the world. I mean, the Lord put a mandate there. There was, a, there, was a, there, was a, there was an impact in the Jesus movement of what took place surrounding Lonnie and Chuck. No one would say that Lonnie was there. It was fundamental to it. <laughs> it was fundamental to the beginning of the movement. Give me a break. It was Lonnie and Chuck. Always Lonnie and Chuck. Chuck and Lonnie. <laughs> and there, people do things that are wrong. They trip up. They stumble. They fail. And we take offense and we back off from the movement. It happens. Then there was things that went on with Catherine Coleman. People backed away from her. But think about it when, the, when it was pure and when it was glorious and when, when, when men weren't getting in the way and doing wrong things and, and messing the whole program up and bringing reproach to Jesus and, and grieving the Holy Ghost. Your conscience might be right, but the Holy Ghost is still grieved. Watch out. Are you listening to me? Yeah. You might have got your conscience right. The Holy Ghost still grieved. You need to read the Word. You need to read the Bible. Mm -mm -mm. Vineyard. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've had to repent because of my attitude towards the vineyard. Well, one day the Lord said, you go repent. Who do you think you are? You all uppity. How can I ever use you with that attitude? You don't understand. You're supposed to be following me. I'm laying my life down. Huh? We think, you know what I'm saying? We, we, <laughs> there, the only way that we can see the reality of all the change that needs to come in our own personal lives is when we stand in the glory. That's it. I mean, Isaiah, Isaiah was on, man. He's on. Listen to him. He's on, Isaiah 118. He's on, man. Huh? I mean, he's just, he's laying it out there. He's preaching the gospel. It's powerful. It's strong. Isaiah chapter 6, he has an encounter. He goes, I'm unclean. I'm an unclean people. I've got unclean lips. Oh, God. The Lord's just standing there. Who's going to go for me? All i got is a bunch of condemnation going on in my house. 
of God. Why? Because you, you encounter his otherness, his holiness, his splendor, his purity, the beauty of all of his life. There's something that you've never seen something so beautiful in your life. And there's nothing to compare to it. It's beautiful what the Lord says. I got your remedy. I got your cure. Seraphim. Go get a coal. Seraphim. The coal is so holiness of holies. It's such code, it's so holies of holies. It's so kodosh, kodosh, It's so holy of holies that the seraphim who with two wings covers his face and two wings covers his feet and with two wings he does fly while he cries holy, holy, holy. And I mean he's a, the seraphims are Pentecostals. Believe you me. They are Pentecostals. They flying around. They're not just dancing and moving. I'm telling you they're bringing the house down. They are. With two wings, they do fly. They're not just hovering either. I'm telling you. The Lord allowed me. Oh, I'm not going to give you that. Huh? Just read for yourself. You see it in the text. That's better revelation than any revelation. The word of God's it. If he was speaking anything different from what's there in the word, they're wrong. Just wrong. Why, are you supposed to hate them now? No, you're supposed to love them. Never keep the unity of spirit, bond of peace, love on people. Father, give you the grace. He will. Seraphim flies with call from off the altar. Can't even touch it. Has to get a special instruments. The tongs, cold tongs, altar tongs, huh? Because he can't touch it. It's all he get burned. He's not affected by fire. He's an angel. Are you with me? They have I can handle fire just fine. They can handle fire better than three Hebrew children. Are you with me? He, he can't touch it. And he flies and he touches his lips with cold from off the altar. From off the altar. The Lord Jesus personally comes and touches your lips with his blood. And he says, you're clean now. Who's going to go for me? I'll go. I'm empowered now. No more condemnation over here. I'm, I listen, people, we're going to have that boldness. you gotta have a, you got to have assurance. you got to have confidence. I'm going to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit has come to give us boldness and assurance and confidence. Those are fruits of the Spirit as much as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. They, these, these are all parts of the fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to give us this boldness, this confidence, this certainty. Word of faith came out of Southern California. People don't know that. Word of faith. Oh, now we're all shaken up. Somebody said, what happened to all the great, Pente what happened to all the pre great Pentecostals in the Assembly of God Church? Okay. Assembly of God pastors that are watching this. I love you. Forgive me. They all left and went into the Word of Faith movement. They did. They're all Assembly of God preachers. By and large, Word of Faith movement, just Assembly of God preachers. Holy Ghost preachers who won the fire of God was tired of religion, tired of the compromise. It went from an apostolic government to a business government. It was, it was coming down from Springfield, Missouri <laughs> in a miserable way. Said, come on, we got to have the fire back again. we got to have the glory back again. <laughs> Claire Grace, other people. Uh, like, there's a long list of folks. Not just Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin is just one person. The Lord touched him. I mean, come on, Kenneth Hagin. Look. He, you know, the Lord brought him back out of hell. He died and went to hell. And uh, the Lord brought him back out of hell. And uh, became a Baptist preacher to start with. Then became a Assembly of God preacher. He sat down and talked with Jesus more than 18 times. I've never talked to Jesus one time. There's things that he said and that he believed that I couldn't fully understand or agree with. <laughs> I never sat down and talked to Jesus 18 times. <laughs> I never had Jesus explain the scripture to me. And to know him, you, you, knew, you knew you were in the presence of a man who knew God, who encountered God. You were in the, you were in the presence of some demon-possessed person. I've been in the presence of demon-possessed people. I've had to deal with witch doctors. I've had to deal with shamans. I've had to deal with unholy people people full of anger and wrath I've had to deal with with occult leaders people under the influence of demon spirits Papa gave me an ability to in the gifts of the discerning of spirits to deal with demon spirits these signs should follow them to believe in my name to cast out devils praise God for that 
to cast out unclean spirits. Paul gave me a, gr a great sensitivity to it. And the more you stay away from sin, and the more you stay in his presence, the more you hate sin and iniquity and love righteousness, the more sensitive you get, the more you're not going to have your television on. You're not going to have these things. I mean, people say, oh, no, he's going to start preaching the clothesline. Get ready. Here goes the clothes. HBO, sin to the max, and all the rest of the stuff. It's ungodly. It's participating with lasciviousness. It's willful sin. It's going after that which God said, they that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let no man deceive you. For these thing, for this sake, the wrath of God comes upon the children to disobedience. Ephesians 5, 6. I'll go through the list here if you need me to. Huh? You go messing around with sin and iniquity and saying it's okay. It's not okay. That's a wrong heart. That heart's not saved. There is nobody pre pre 1930s, pre Billy Sunday. I'll just go ahead and bring it out that would have ever confirmed such a confession, not in any denomination, not in any denomination, not even Episcopalian, Lutheran, nothing, Methodist, nothing. Huh? Are you listening to me? For you to confess, oh, I'm unrighteous, I'm going to sin more or less every day. Dude, the people that have been dealing with you just go to the mourner's bench over here. Come on now. Oh, you, you need to change. The Lord wants to change you. He wants to fill you with his love. He wants to fill you with his same heart and disposition towards wrongdoing and sin and iniquity. We, in the last days, deceiving spirits have gone out. Doctrine to devils, seducing spirits. We see the rise of the apostate church like never before. It's, it's measurable. It's quantitative. Even the academicians in the Presbyterian movement can quantitate the apostasy that exists right now. And now with a new hyper-grace movement, it's gone to another level. And what's going to change it? Our intellectualism, going and debating the doctrines of God? No, an encounter with God. There has to be a change from the inside. That change, people, the only way that Holy Ghost conviction is going to return to the church, the only way that there is going to be such a wonderful, sovereign moving of God is because there's a people on the earth that's crying out to God saying, Father, your will be done. Lord, we want you to come rule and reign over us. Lord, we want you to come and rule us with your rod of iron. Lord, we want you to come rule us with your spirit of grace. Lord, we want to be taught your ways. Lord, we want to learn to walk with you, obey you in every way. Oh, God, that you purposed us for, to obey you. So you designed us to live. Yes. That's the start in our hearts. Friendship with the world is an act of hostility against God. He's separate from the world. He's not of this world. When he said you're not of this world, he's telling us we're in his, we're in his holiness. We're with him. When he, when, he, when he looks at us and tells us, no, you're not the, the temple of the Holy Ghost. When he tells us that we, that his Holy Spirit, his spirit of holiness lives on the inside of us. He's talking to us about the spirit of otherness. Theological, a theological terminology would be transcendent other. He was transcendent other in the Old Testament. Not anymore. Paul, who, was, who so wanted to earn a place of standing with God so that he could sit at the table of the righteous. Suddenly, on the road to Damascus, encountered the righteousness of God. He encountered a righteousness that far super exceeded all the righteousness of the law. He found, he found oneness, the mystery of the fellowship. He talks about the mystery of the fellowship in Colossians. The mystery of the fellowships, where it's not this mystical trying to attain something through works. The Father just says, come on in. He says, all of you that are far away, come on in. He said, either you Scythians, all you ungodly, they're the worst culture, the evilest culture, you Scythians, come on in. You no different from the holy people of Israel. Come on in. Everybody that's near, everybody that's far away. He says, peace. You know what peace is? Peace is Total erasing and absolving of all condemnation. It's the salamim offering. It's the place where now you are invited. Come sit down at the table and break bread with the master. 
To share, huh, as it were, you know, the, the same life. But now on a whole nother level than just you would be taught from in the Hashiva, from the Mishnah. This is now where he gives us his life. He shares his life with us. He gives us his life. I have his life. Do you have his life? You have a, do you have his life? That's the confession of the faith. The faith, to be justified by faith, to be justified by faith, to be made righteous by faith, means that you have been made righteous by being born again. Because being born again is the faith. To be justified by faith means that you've been born of the Spirit. You've been made righteous by the Holy Spirit. To be justified by faith means that you have been made righteous, been made holy and acceptable under the living God, given the gift of righteousness. I've been given the gift of holiness. So Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and 24, he says that we've been recreated. We've been created anew in righteousness, in righteousness, in true holiness. I mean, that is a radical thing. He just gave it to me. He gave me the gift. He gave me the gift. It's a gift. It is a glorious, unspeakable gift. That we can't, if you really had an encounter with him and you've received this gift, it is precious to you. It's more precious to you than your own life. You're not going to abuse it. You're not going to trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. You're not going to bring him to an open shame. You don't want to. Sin is treason. It's not missing the mark. Harmatia, by context, does not mean missing the mark. Maybe with Aristotle, but not here. Sin is treason. It's treason. It's far more than missing the mark. It's worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. He bore the sin. <laughs> he bore it in his own body. It's, it's a miserable, evil vermin. Oh, God. His blood cleanses it and washes it. So tonight, no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how much failure, no matter how many wrong things you've done, because you have a heart to know God and to walk with Him and you want to get it right, garments are white as snow. He's spotless. You're unreprovable, unrebukable, unblameable in the sight. Huh. You're a gift from the Father to Jesus Christ. You in Him and don't even exist outside of Him. You have no existence outside of Him. Can you imagine that? You in Him. All by His blood. You in Him. I've been, in, I've been allowed by God to go to some very important places to be around some very important people. And the only way that I got there is because I was with the right person. They, they said, he's with me. I get to go past all of the security and all the guards. He's with me. Jesus is saying, he's with me. But then he goes and he says something that's so mind-boggling. He says, I'm with him. My goodness. The fellowship. He said, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to love you. All the way to Perfection. I'm here to serve you and to love you and to minister to you and to forgive you till you learn all the ways of the Almighty God so that in all your ways you please the Father. Somebody said, how am I going to be able to hear? Well done, my good and faithful servant. How is it ever going to be possible with all my failings and with all my weakness that I should ever hear such a thing? Because you and Him, you, and you don't even exist outside of Him. <laughs> he that has the Son he that possesses him, he literally, he exists within me and I exist within him. He that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son to possess, it's an intimacy. John's reflecting back, no question about it, to John chapter 15. To live and to abide in him, to be like a branch in the vine who can do nothing without him. Who's been invited to come? Blora si te ki a te ti a po po ki si a te a bu chapatai. Di sa toi la maya. Te ki a te chata na de ki. Maya sa te ku paya. Zuturi na je di pukushi paya. The Holy Spirit would so stir our lives to return fully under God. 
The Holy Spirit would so stir, stir our lives to come back into a place that Father has given to us in His grace, a place to occupy at His table, to sit with the mighty in His presence. <laughs> to find ourselves so filled up with Him. <laughs> it's more than we can contain. To have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, lead us into all the ways of God's holiness. To show us the path thereof and the way thereof. <laughs> to give us the privilege to know and understand, to be able to comprehend what it is Father is saying. To live this, to live this abundant and glorious life. There's got to be a turn, there's got to be a rending of the heart. That there's going to have to be some just basic commitments. I'm finding out that people don't want to commit over and again there's got to be commitments you just got to say this is what I'm going to do I know a prophet I know a pro I've known many prophets I know a prophet and, and, and he's a very close and dear friend of mine he sits on my oversight board because I need oversight I can get as many people up there as possible hallelujah he's my dear friend great man of God God's used him to call so many people into the kingdom to be like a Almost like an Old Testament prophet in many ways. He's got a real simple thing. He says, read your Bible, say your prayers, and be good. How hard is that? How hard is that? That's not hard. But there's some commitment because there's a lot of stuff pulling on us. And I have to take it to another level. And I said, that's true. But the only way that you're going to do it is to be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. Father's given, a way, uh, given us an opportunity to be filled with the Spirit. He said, there's one way. He said, there's one way. He said, there's one way to redeem the day for the time is evil. He said, there's one way. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. Somebody said, well, what does that mean, to be filled with the Spirit? Ha. <laughs> It means to be so overwhelmed with the presence of God that you have, not only do you not even have any more room to contain it, but it comes busting out of you like rivers. It's not a well, just a wellspring. It's not just a wellspring. It's not just a wellspring. It's not just a wellspring. Theologically, you can, understand, you can equate to be filled and to be baptized just in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. The Lord said you'd be baptized not many days from now. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all filled. Okay, you see that? That was difficult, huh? And they began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. An entrance gift into the realms of divine glory. An unlimited gift where we hook up with God the Holy Ghost and he begins to, just, begins to teach us how to do miracles. Huh? Do signs and wonders. Great grandpa, he didn't do miracles, signs and wonders until he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that Southern Baptist preacher, if he saw an ambulance go by, he was better than the doc. He did a U-turn and ran the thing down. When they were bringing him out, grandpa was allowed to pray. He was a well-respected Preacher, he's allowed to pray. Whoever is sick, he's in the name of Jesus, be healed. Huh? Because he stepped over into a place where the teacher could teach him how to move in the ministry of Jesus. Somebody said, would you please break down sanctification for me? Are you ready? Sanctification is the call to come and live the life of Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost. That's what sanctification is. It's the call, come live the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. That's all it is. Come live the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. Come, oh, Jesus, come. Can you see him? Can you hear him? Oh, God. Father God. Preacher's daughter in 1860 wrote a song. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. my heart it is thine own for it is now your royal throne that's the holiness movement of 1860 and 1870 
Every 30 to 40 years, a great revival would take place in Wells. There was this young man, his name was Evan Roberts. And he said, at the age of 12 years old, 13 years old, he said to his pastor, he said, you think that there will be another great Wells revival while I'm alive? And pastor said, we didn't know. It's determined, determined by the sovereign will of God, God Almighty. He said, but this is what you can do. You can hunger and thirst after righteousness. You can want the kingdom of God more than anything else in this life. Be in every meeting. Don't miss a meeting because you don't know. Every great revival happened when people didn't expect it. And it always happened in the people who desperately wanted it. Evan Roberts took that and he lived by it. And it didn't take long. At the age of 21 years of age, at 21 years of age, he was in a little small building in a little insignificant coal mining town in Wells. And he began to pray a prayer that he's prayed over and again. Oh, God, I have built your altar. Lord, I've laid the word in order according to your word. The sacrifice is ready. Send your fire now. And the sacrifice he was talking about was his life. I'm yours and only yours to live only for you. I am dead. I am crucified with Christ. I am, I am buried with him by baptism into his death. I'm raised up together with him. I'm alive together with him. I'm seated together with him in a heavenly realm. That is the apostolic creed. That is the doctrine of the word. That is the testimony of faith. That is scripture. That is the description of who we are. That was the holiness movement. And suddenly, the power of God came in such a way that in less than six, six months, 100,000 people rushed into the kingdom with a radical transformation of the power of God. So many that the pastors didn't have, couldn't get around to everybody to confirm everybody, to bear witness that everybody was saved. Such a, such a move of God. Six months, beginning September 28, 1904. One man and eight other people. Nine folks, roughly. Sometimes it up be to, they have tendency up to about 12. 13. Come on, man. A youth group. A youth group. A youth group. Shook the world. They changed the world. They changed culture. They changed culture. They subdued kingdoms. They subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. Mm. They wax valiant and fight, put to flight the aliens. <laughs> the armies of the aliens. <laughs> they bound the strong men. Small movements of God, the Moravian movement. I mean, I just told, I could just go on talk about revivalists, talk about great revivals, talk about things that God did among a small group of people. Just anybody. It doesn't take a... It, it, it's, the Father's not... It doesn't just like a large group of people. It's just it's very difficult to get a large group of people moving in the same direction. Everybody's pulling every which way. Mm-mm-mm. Tonight we're getting ready to have communion. It's very sacred to me. It's very precious to me. People need to understand how sacred it is. It's nothing to be. A, it's nothing to partake of as ritual. It's something that you partake of, saying, "I live by Jesus. I live by His body and His blood." Huh? If you've ever killed an animal, if you've ever slit an animal's throat, if it was alive, the blood will splatter on you. Hey, eh? because it's right at the carotid, right? These hunters. I'm talking to these people who know. Hey. Eh? Or even if you ring, it, ring the neck of a dove, blood splatters. You can't keep it off of you. That is the whole foundation and framework in which we look at the sacrifice of Jesus and the blood that was offered for us, this innocent lamb, this one who was guilty of nothing, who deserved nothing. He did nothing. He deserved no wrong. He deserved no, no you know, punishment. He did nothing wrong. He did it all for you and me. And I, I take a hold of that communion cup. I'm taking a hold of the blood of Jesus now. I'm not try, talking about, you know, some transubstantiation. I'm not talking about all of I'm telling you, it just represents his blood. But for me, there's a spiritual dynamic that his blood is, is there. His blood is, for, it, it's by his blood that I enter in. I, I come with all boldness into the holies of holies. <laughs> by the blood of Jesus Christ through the veil of his flesh. And I pray that you'll come in and stay in. Don't go back out anymore. Come and stay in. Come in here. 
but I'm only allowed in because of the blood. <laughs> Take away the blood. He would say, he would say, oh, oh, the blood of Jesus. I just, I just say, I just ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse me, and I'll be cleansed. Maybe. Right? We need to examine what, what you're saying there. I would tell you what the scripture says. Say as you, it's not quite sacred enough to you yet. Say as the fear of God hadn't hit you yet. If you walk in the light as He's in the light, then you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And that's what the Word of God says, huh? If we sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Word of God says. His blood is not for our sins only, but for the whole sins of the whole world. He is the propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins. Oh God, does He pop over? But that's got to be sacred to us. That's, thank you, Jesus. I mean, it's a cup of rejoicing. Somebody come help me. Pour this out for a while. Just pour that out while I'm talking, please. Come some help. Come help. You can help. That's enough. We get too many pants up there. See if you want to help. You can help. I don't if you want to help. I don't want to. I, don't want to, I wouldn't want. The Lord would never send anybody away who wants to help. <laughs> His eyes go to and fro looking for anyone, and he's not picky. Anyone. <laughs> anyone who has set their heart upon him, and he can show forth his power to their lives. Is the Lord Jesus Christ going to show forth his glory through your life, sweetheart? Through great signs and wonders and miracles. There he goes. Are you certain about it? Yeah, he said so. That's really good enough right there, isn't it? It's the right answer, isn't it? Oh, well, somebody came and prophesied over me and said, well, big deal. Look at how much God's prophesied over you. Nothing's working yet. And now forgive me. <laughs> I mean, Father's prophesied a whole Bible over us. Come on. I mean, need somebody. Come on. Somebody else coming. Eh, look. Go speak, speak his word. I mean, I, listen, I, I love Polycarp. Polycarp's address to us helps us to understand how the earth, first century church was because if you read the epistle of Polycarp to the, to the Philippians, it really, first of all, it helps all of us to study extant manuscripts. And, and really, you know, we talk about the autographs and, and, and understanding that the extant, you know, trying to measure whether the extant manuscripts or existing manuscripts really reflect or are identical to the autograph. Well, we're, we're, we're blessed with what took place in the life of one man. Polycarp was the last guy around who had been with the disciples, you see, and with John. And so Church of Philippi said, would you please write to us and tell us what it was like? You know what he did? He quoted scripture. Google it. You can download it. The epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. It's beautiful. First of all, it helps us to, because he starts in Matthew and quotes something from Matthew all the way through the Gospels. And, you know, it allows us to, you know, for those of us who believe in the inerrancy and infallibility of God's word that he's watched over his word to perform in it just like it was the day it was written. It gives us a lot of, you know, <laughs> it gives us a lot of ammunition, for lack of a better word, a lot of support. But it's beautiful how they spoke. Speak according to the word. You know, I said, Aunt Baby, is the Lord going to use you? He's going to use you in these last days? Signs wonder. She said, yes, the word of God says he's going to use me. That's the word of faith. Word, word of God says it. There's a lot of people who took and did all kinds of wild, weird things. People who have abused the gospel, made merchandise out of the gospel. They don't invalidate the move. They don't invalidate. Wrongdoings don't invalidate. Lonnie's wrongdoings don't invalidate Calvary Chapel. Huh? And I could, Wimber's wrongdoings don't invalidate Vineyard. The whole thing. You don't throw the whole thing out. I can go on. There's so many, I, I I'm not going to do that. Because just, I think it's, it's just not even necessary. The reality of it is, is the Word of God is powerful and it's living. The Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We don't even know what step to take unless we, we're taking it by the Word of God. And Polycarp shows us here, here's how you're supposed to speak. You're supposed to speak the Word. And if, you do, if you're speaking anything other than the Word, it's a manifestation that there is no light in you. There is no truth in you. Just speak the Word. Just going to declare the Word. Just going to say what God says. He said this. People don't like this in today's modern-day Pentecostal movement. 
Jesus said this. Anyone who believes. These works which I do show you do also in greater works. These signs shall follow them. These miracles shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. Pretty radical stuff. Pretty radical stuff, eh? Oh, Mark 16, 17. Not supposed to be in the Bible. Yeah, it is. It says there as much as John 3, 16 is. You want to do away with that? Got to deal away with John 3, 16. It's verifiable. So some theologian said it wasn't supposed to be there. He's wrong. He's wrong. So he said, how can you say that? Well, I've got 99% of the manuscripts that exist on my side. He's got 1% on his, less. Mark 16, 17 belongs there. Jesus' words. Jesus' commission. It's his commission in Mark. That's the commission of Lord Jesus Christ in Mark. The gospel of Mark. How are we going to do these things? The Lord says, I, I've ordained you to bring forth fruit. He said, I, I called you and I ordained you. I chose you. You didn't cho cho choose me. I chose you and I've ordained you to bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. And so what is that fruit? Mark in John 15, 16. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, you will do it. I want you to prove that. Huh? It need not be proven. It's the Word of God. It's the absolutism of the Word of God. It, 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 it exists. It's, it's validated. It stands forever. It's unshakable, unmovable. All you and I have to do is believe it. And then we step in it, step into it, and begin to participate with these things. Jesus went and preached the gospel in a unique way. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then shall the end come. This gospel of the kingdom. So go everywhere preach. Paul said, I went and I preached, not with the word which men's wisdom teach, but with the demonstration of the, of the Holy Ghost. Demonstration. Power. And of the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. It says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. It said that your faith not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, Lord, we ask you to come do something that nobody else can do. No matter preaching, you get it done. No matter sermons can get it done. But your word can get it done. Lord, your word... And the power of the Holy Spirit that is here right now with us can get it done. This baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire can get it done. Be careful over there. Be careful. Just be careful. I just, you know, just, just handle with care. That's all. You know me. I just, it just, everything's just got to be careful. I just, it's just not common. It's just not ordinary. Uh -huh. And I, and I just, you know, your help is good. The help is good. I just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Listen, if tonight, if if your children, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have your children have communion, your children have to know that this is more than juice and cookies. Your children have to understand this is more than ju juice and crackers. It has to be. The Lord says that. This is a pretty radical statement. Could I just let me just read it to you, just in um, just so that everybody can get. Just open up your Bibles there, First Corinthians chapter eleven. For as I received in the Lord Jesus Christ, verse twenty-three says, "For as I received from the Lord Jesus Christ that which also I deliver unto you." That the Lord Jesus, the same night that he was 
the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do you in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Oh. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's pretty radical, isn't it? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Say, I take mine now. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Somebody said, well, how do I get worthy? Huh? How do I get worthy? I says, man, I'm scared now. How do I get worthy? You want me to tell you how you get worthy? He is worthy. You get, you, 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 you do something he's made so simple. You call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And he delivers you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, Summer's the youngest one. She's basically three months old. Are you three months old now? She's almost three months. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How do you get worthy? Jesus makes me worthy. Hallelujah. He makes me, he's, me, he's my worthiness. Huh? He did, the Lord says, I beseech you by the mercies of the Lord Jesus Christ that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Hallelujah. So how many holy people we have in here? I, I, I'm over here. I so said, how did you get holy? Not by any works of righteousness, which I did, but because of his great love wherewith he loved me. Even when I was dead and trespassed in sin, he quickened me, made me alive together with Jesus Christ. Now I'm saved. <laughs> by his grace. Amen. Hallelujah. By the, by the, by the sovereign act of almighty God. I'm saved by the sovereign acting of his divine passion and love for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how I get worthy. I accept the offering that was acceptable to the Father when Jesus offered himself at Calvary's cross almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and came up by the spirit of holiness from the dead, proving that he had purchased our salvation, that he had redeemed us from every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Because of the Lord Jesus. Because of it. Just make sure that your, your children understand what they're doing. If they're old enough to understand what they're doing, then it's fine for them to partake of, the, of, of this communion. If they're not old enough, if you're not sure that they're old enough, you need to spend more time at home with them helping them. Somebody say, how does a, how does a child need to be? To be saved. Well, look. John was in the third trimester and just got filled with the Spirit. He's still in the belly. Huh? At the salutation of Mary, he leapt for joy. Huh? So, we've seen the power of God come on children at a very young age. Little Jake was up in Hawaii a couple weeks ago. Stuck his finger in the wrong hole. And when a big eel came and bit his finger, tried to bite it off. Huh. Let's see it. Just about bit it completely off. Huh? Hey. And, and you jumped up, and what would you say? 
He said, in the name of Jesus, pain go. And did it go? Yeah. And it went. And the, the doctors were just amazed. The little finger's about completely torn off. And usually they basically they end up in the stomach of the eel. He now knows you do not stick your finger in the hole of a reef. That is one thing you do not do. <laughs> and then what else did you do? It just gushing with blood. What else did you do? You having a hard time remembering? What else did you do? Do you believe that the Lord started working a miracle on your finger? Jake, you know, you, you're just as anointed as anybody else. You're just, born as, you're just as much born of the Spirit as anybody else. Come up here. You can come here. Come here. You come over here and help me. Man of the man, a man of the spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's come over here and stand by Aunt Geneva. That's what that's what Elizabeth used to call her grandfather, Uncle Bill. Son, I can't hear you. You're gonna have to just turn it up. Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to. You don't have to try to do that song you're doing. It's okay. Just, just, just play. I want you. To, I want you to play. I want you to play. I want you to just worship a little bit. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are a Passover. I don't believe that there's, I believe it's pretty much quantifiable that there wasn't too many people in, Israel, in Egypt that night that was worthy of deliverance. You know what I'm saying? They all acted a terrible part, pretty much, almost every day, having come out of Egypt. But look what the Lord did for them. This is the Passover supper. This is the Todah offering, or the Salamim. So the closest things that we have in the Old Testament to them. The offering of thanksgiving, the offering of great rejoicing, Passover offering. Jesus is our Passover. Guess what happened to them that night? If there was a sick one among them, they got healed. So he said, how do you know that? Because the next day there was no sick or feeble among them. And so you can't convince me that the night before that there was no sick or feeble among them. Jesus. I mean, I just, I want you to, I want you to go, I want you to go over into the realm of the kingdom of the dear son tonight when you take a, communion i want you to be in a heavenly realm i want you to be i want you to be in the atmosphere of the spirit atmosphere of the holy ghost where you're experiencing the manifest presence of jesus is really synonymous with being in heaven jesus said if i work miracles by the spirit then the kingdom of god has come to you i mean you know when the when paul said in colossians 1 13 you've been translated out of the kingdom of this world in the kingdom of the dear son come on if i'm in the kingdom of the dear son my goodness i'm in the heavenly realm A.B. Simpson, the great Presbyterian preacher, founder of the, of the uh, uh, Christian Missionary Alliance Church, had it right. He said, "Jesus, he said, heaven is Jesus, and Jesus is mine, so I'm living in heaven today. To live in a heavenly realm, to exist in a heavenly, heavenly realm. I remember hearing, I remember, take, talk about the Calvary Chapel, but I remember, I remember hearing Chuck Smith say, I want to live such in a heavenly realm and such interaction with the Lord that when I die, there's not much transition from here to there. Eh? Well, but that's the revival language. That's the move of God. That's move of God talk. That's what that. What's what those kind of things you say when this, this, 
atmosphere is supercharged with the presence of the Lord. We're just going to have to learn how to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and recognize that's not some esoteric thing. But that's a real, genuine relationship in which you and I experience and feel the demonstration of His glory and of His goodness where we are, are filled and strengthened in a real and, 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 and verifiable way, strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord and the power of His might to take upon ourselves the full armament of God. It's far different when Father gives you His armament than when Saul gives you His armament. Saul's armor won't work. God's armor worked just good, just fine. I want you to see it by faith. I'm going to get you in the Word of Faith movement now. All you Calvary Chapel people and Baptist people and Assemblies of God people, you Nazarene people, we're going to move you over to the Word of Faith now. Which is really what all, which is really, really what the, the uh, healing faith movement of, the, uh, of Pentecostal holiness of, 18, of the eight, late 1800s, so it's, that's all it is. And it didn't start there. It started back 2,000 years ago. It started before that even. To understand the power and the authority of God's Word if you just believe His Word. Huh? If you, just, if you just begin to proclaim His Word. Hallelujah. Begin just like your salvation. The miracle of salvation. Tonight, in Jesus' mighty name, I want you to grab a hold of a divine interaction with the Lord. Jesus said, if you drink my blood, you, you eat my flesh, you have life. You, he says, he said, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has what? Eternal life. That's what he says. And it's what he says. John chapter 6. Some of you looking at me like a deer staring in your headlights. But he's talking about dwelling and abiding in him. Let me read that to you. Some of you I just make sure that everybody knows what they're doing here before I do this. This is so sick. This is, I, just, I can't do a short communion service. I can't do anything short. Let me have your Bible. Have you turned to John? Where, you, where were you turning? You going back to 1 Corinthians? I want to go to John chapter 6. I'm doing John chapter 6 now. See, I just believe what Jesus said. Did you know that that's the word of faith movement? Somebody said you word of faith? No. Not that one. Not like you're thinking, but I am word of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't do anything but by the word. And the word produces faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you listening with me here? Jesus said in verse 53, Truly, truly, or with absolutely, I tell you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Talk about fellowship. Talk about living by Him. Talk about taking a hold in a very personal way of what He did for us at Calvary. Talking about it being meaningful. It becoming a part of your being. If you could see me in the spirit right now, I got blood. I got blood dripping off of me. I've been marked with the blood. It, it, the Lord said, take the blood and put it upon the linda on the doorpost. When you do that, what does that look like? Huh? It looks like a cross, really, if you think about it. Doesn't it? You put it up on, put up on the on the lintel, you know what's going to do? You apply it with hyssop anyway. It's going to drip down. And the post. It's on me. Blood of Jesus on you. This is a pretty radical thing. Jesus had a great movement going on. I mean, the church was really growing. He was gaining popularity. It could be classified as a mega church at this moment in time. It just had over 5,000 people in the meeting. Not counting men, not <laughs> women and children. And then he starts talking like this. And people are going, what on who? What? And they left. Even, his, even many of his disciples did follow him no more. It got down to the 12 again. He pared it right back down. He said, will you go also? Over this message, over this. Over this message. This is a hard saying. I'm bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I live him by him. I live by his life. 
I live by his substance. His flesh is meat indeed and his blood is drink indeed. I live by that. That my only means of existence is defined out of that which he provided for me when he took my sins on, in his own body on the tree. When he was at the whipping post and was wounded for my transgression. Was bruised for my lawlessness or iniquity. By his wound, I'm healed. By his wound. Tonight, if you have any unforgiveness in your heart, you need to forgive before you come up here and take this. Because then it would be, un you'd be, huh? You'd, looky here. He'll forgive you as many times as you need so long as you'll forgive from the heart. The only way you're going to be able to forgive from the heart is you're going to have to learn how to let the Holy Spirit fill you up with love and let that love flow out of you. Ooh, hallelujah. And he'll do it. It's a miracle of love. And you're just starting to love everybody. Doesn't matter who they are. Mm, it's a wonderful thing to have such communion, such fellowship, to have such a witness, the witness of the Spirit, where the Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Hallelujah. In other words, you could actually say, because it's the same preposition in the Greek language, where the Spirit bears witness in your spirit that you have been born of God, that you've been born of the Spirit. You can't come into the realms of the kingdom. You can't know the way realms of the kingdom. You can't see the kingdom unless you're born of the Spirit. Who rababa sekeya. Umbrefete. Unda fesikotaya. Lukana manjeke. Hallelujah. Let me just, let me finish reading this. I just, does anybody mind me reading the word? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood. Has eternal life. That's radical, ain't it? What is eternal life? It's God's life. It's the life of the Spirit. It's the life of the Father. It's the life of the Son. It's His life. It flows right into me. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up in the last day. Mighty God. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Here's a key scripture, verse 56. Here it is. It's the unveiling of what this actually means. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. I believe I counted, I believe I counted, it was well over 60 times in the, just in the epistle to the Ephesians alone of a reference to God being in us and, him be, and us being in him. In one epistle. Over 40, 40, approximately 43 times the Lord calls us saints, holy ones. Twice we're called Christians in the Bible, once by reference. Just, they called Christians. They called them Christians. Huh? And the other by identity, as it were. You know, first they were first called Christians, Christians at Antioch. You understand what I'm saying? Acts 16. Why is it that we shirk away, draw back from the identity that God has given us in the Christ Jesus? I'm not. It's the faith. It's the means, it's justification by faith. It's being made righteous by faith. And the faith is the new covenant in his blood that remits, erases, does away, removes all sin, every bit of it. So that there, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Having your conscience now purified. Huh? by this wonderful work of divine grace. Tonight, I just, want, I, I just want you to be able to come up here. I want, you to, I want, you to, I want this to be fellowship to you. I, want, I, I, don't want it to be, I don't want it to be the bread of affliction. I want it to be the, blood, the bread of liberation. Hey? 
Don't let it be the cup of bitterness. Let it be the cup of joy. You don't have to cry over his death. The Lord break us sometimes. We're just deep, deeply moved and we, and we weep. But I, I think that people get the wrong idea. This is a time for feast and joy celebration. To send portions one unto another and give gifts to the poor. Huh? And rejoice in his presence. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 8, speaking of the Feast of Tabernacles. But also Esther, what is it, 12, right? Or 9. Somebody help me. The deliverance that took place at Purim. It's okay. You know what I'm saying. There's only two times in the scripture that. That the feast and the celebration like that is referred to. We, here we're, you know, it's Christmas time, right? We're celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus. This is a time to rejoice. Huh? Send portions one to another and give gifts to the poor. Rejoice before the Lord for all the gifts that he gave. Girls, you, you girls, I think I got it. You guys can sit down if you want. Thank you so much, Geneva. You think we got enough up here? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go to Abbasi, keep the under the Abbasi, cut the issue, come on, cut the inakaya. Every fatusife. Lord, I just ask you to work a miracle tonight, and if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, I ask you to reveal yourself to them, even as you revealed yourself to the disciples in the breaking of bread. Lord, we just ask this to be the face bread tonight, the bread of your presence, as it were, the unveiling of the hidden one. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that everybody who grabs a hold of these things here tonight, they represent your person, your body, and your blood. That there would be just that much more of a living reality in their life. Of what you did for them when you died at Calvary's cross. Hey, if God so loved you. Huh, if God commended his love towards us. In such a way. If God spared not his own son, but offered him up. For the sins of us all, shall he not also by him freely give us all things? Do you understand where that is? That the context of that is? That you are, pre -pre that you are predestinated to be conformed unto the very image of the Son. I pray you grab a hold of that. That he may be the firstborn among many brethren. I pray tonight that you'll let a move of the Spirit of God start in your life, a revival take place in your life, that you'll have far more than a New Year's resolution, that you'll have a consecration, a vowing of your life over to God, a commitment of your life. Listen, I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord will so move into your life that if you do anything or allow anything wrong go on in your life, you will feel so ashamed because, you, because of the awareness of how much He loves you. Because of the fact that you know you're consecrated only to the holy things. Hey? And immediately, you know what he does? Immediately, he's there to take all the shame away. He's amazing. He's unimaginable. He just erased all the sin. He erases all the wrongdoing. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. To be remembered no more. Father, I pray tonight change takes place that the affliction and the torment on people's bodies and souls and spirits be removed not only those who are sitting in here but those who are watching by the web and those who are watching on YouTube Father we pray for a great shaking a great moving of the spirit a great rushing mighty wind once again, clothed in tongues of fire, rest upon the head of everyone that there will be a people with an expectation to believe that it can happen again that it believe it can happen you know, when Israel rejected God, Numbers chapter 14, 
He rejected God, and they wouldn't listen to him. The father said to Moses, said, don't worry about it. It's be all right. Surely as I live, this whole earth will be filled with my glory. Though, I'm going to have people who honor me, serve me, who live for me. I want you to hear this. Sin is treason. Covenant breaking is treachery. And telling a lie is so bad. It's deserving of an eternal place called the lake of fire. Folks don't even get that and understand that. And understand the judgment of God, the wrath of God that is revealed against sin. But it's time that God's people start understanding. And it's time that you and I start believing the reality of where people are, are going right now. They're dying, going to a devil's hell. And the only possibility of them being saved and the mind-blinding spirits that govern their life being broken off in this evil time is for you and I to take hold of God. I want you to take hold of Him. Live by Him. Let me just have everybody over here in this right-hand section. Those of, that are on the right, would you stand? And I, I guess the only way for you to do this, they're supposed to actually set the table up over here, I think, because people can't really walk around that way. So if, if a couple of folks who can balance that really well, would you pick it up and kind of set it right over here for me? And that way people can march by it and I can give this to them. You can do it. Just back this. There you go. Just go that way just a little. Perfect. Okay. Well, I tell you right now. How are we going to do this? Yeah, that'll work. Just come, just come right around here. And then just, you just file right back to your seat. Just come just row by row. Here you go. Father, thank you for your anointing. Father, I thank you for the blessing right now in Jesus' name. And be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit right now. Be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to yourself in psalms and hymns. Be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Spirit. Bodhisattva. Be filled. Hallelujah. Be filled. Be blessed. Now, let your house be restored to life again. Be filled with the Spirit. Kudamaseya. Be filled. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> be filled. Bless you. Be filled. It's your sister. Nice to meet you, sister. Be filled. Mangelakiata. Be filled. Lomombrase. Be filled. Destiporane. Be filled. Be filled. Listen, I believe in God that there's no one going to be leave out of here sick tonight. If you've had pain or disease in your life, if you've had torment, if you've had oppression, if you've had affliction, if you've had things that you've not been able to get past, if you, you've had continual reoccurring sin in your life, whatever. I, I play, pray tonight in the name of Jesus that you're going to find a glorious ability, a divine ability, a strength of the Lord and the power of His might to stand against all the works of darkness. La Sate, Le Rushai, Hallelujah, Le Rushai, Potest, Mongeleya, Texto Rimeneya, Sitalame, Ilamonje. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, be blessed. Be blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. How you like that? Be blessed. God says for you to be blessed. He said, take it. You take it. Go ahead and take it. That's right. Got to reach out there and lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. We got everybody? This second. You guys are doing great. Be blessed. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Come. Be healed. Be healed. There's healing tonight. There's healing. There's a fountain. It's filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath its flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Hallelujah. 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 Now in Jesus' name. Now in the name of the living God. 
Hallelujah. Washed. I am washed. Just, just, I want you to just play the melody. There's a fountain. I want, you to, I want you to play the melody in the cross. You. Be blessed in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ, be blessed. I command you to be blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ, from this day forward, live by the life of God. Live by the life of Jesus. Don't be stunned. Be happy. In Jesus' name, be blessed. And the baby inside, be blessed. Be blessed. I command you to be blessed. Take your place in the inheritance in the kingdom of God. You know what your place in inheritance in the kingdom of God is? Do you know what it is? It is Jesus. Don't let it be a stump. Don't let ever a question ever stump you again. Your blessing and your inheritance in the kingdom of God is Jesus. And what a blessing. And what an inheritance. Is that good enough for you? Do you need a better gift? Is it what you always wanted? Be healed. Be blessed. How are you doing? Father, we thank you that you have washed away all the sins by your precious blood and you brought forth a new creation on the inside by the Spirit. Huh? Got a new heart and new spirit, right? Yeah, you do. Here, take that. He loves you so too. Hey, how are you doing? You know what you're doing over here, Faith? I believe you do. Huh? But I'm not sure about Judah. Judah, you got it put together? Do you know what you're doing? What is this right here? Cracker. It's a cracker? Yeah, but what does it represent? It does. You got it. Okay. Be careful. It's a balancing act. And what does that represent? That's right. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. For mama and daddy. Hallelujah. Be blessed, Nicole. Be blessed. Just be blessed. You've been empowered. You know, that's not like the, it's not like the Lord's com you know, it's command. But it's not like it's like it's an empowerment. Do you know what this is? You do? Have you given your life to Jesus, sweetie? You have? And he's washed away all your sins, right? And he's made you a new creation. Eh? Well, here, take that. And you know what that is, right? What does that represent? That's correct. And you got to be really careful with that because that's precious, right? Amen. Bless her, Jesus. Well, let's pray for healing now. Be healed. Yep. That's right. How are you? Hey, are you getting everything that you want for Christmas? Is it happening right now? <laughs> hey, Lucas, how are you doing? How, how, what is this? It's the body of Christ. And you've been born again, right? You've been born of the Spirit. You're filled with the Spirit too, huh? Born of the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Ghost. Here, take this. Jesus said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Just everybody hang on to it. Of course, I kind of know. <laughs> hey, there's a fountain, the healing streams. They never shall run dry. There's a place of rest I find. Where all my burdens. Hey, how are you doing? You know what this is? It is. It represents his body, eh? How are you doing? We love you, buddy. Blessed. Kutak Nexi Palanea. How are things going with you? Very good. You living for Jesus? Living by Jesus. Isn't that awesome that we got that privilege, that help? That ability, that grace. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. 
perfects everything that concerns us, provides for us all that we have need of. Oh, there's a fountain. Take it. Lay hold on eternal life. See, Jesus said, take, eat. Huh? That's what he said. There's a place of rest I find for all my burdens I leave behind. That's a little high. Do you see that high? Could you go down? Because I like to sing in, cro in the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, tonight we recognize that you broke the bread of the covenant for us. When you bore our sins in your own body, when at the whipping post you bore the stripes of the cruelty of men that we might be healed. Lord Jesus, tonight we ask you that every person in this place would step into a greater dimension of communion and fellowship with you. That in this wonderful, miraculous provision that you have given to us, where we may live by your very body, that from this day forward, we find all our life, draw all our life from fellowship with you. Because without you, we can do nothing. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. Thank you that you are the door. That there's no way to come to the Father but by you. And that you've provided yourself for us. So that we can live with you. Now and throughout the ages. Say, Lord Jesus. Come rule over me. I want to be under your government. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Kisha Galamo. Amen. Amen. Gutrabala. Ila Kamun Sandeya. Father, I am tired of those professors at UC Santa Cruz messing with your servant and trying to withhold the doctorate degree from him. In Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. You for the kingdom and the kingdom alone. So all you do is kingdom. That's my baby. In the, in the cross, in the they had eaten he took the cup and he said this is the new covenant I have a Bible at home I opened it one, one day I opened it up and, and it was at a page and it only had two words on it and I sat there just staring at it the two words is New Testament <laughs> new covenant this is the new covenant Jesus said, this is the new covenant. This is the new dimension, the new life, the new realm in which you'll interact with me. This is my blood, Jesus said, that I give to you for the remission, erasing, removal of all sin. For all the impurities to go. If you wanted to walk into the holiness of God and interact with the holiness of God, the vermin had to die. The impurity had to be put to death. Something had to take the vermin. 
Something had to take the impurity and had to be destroyed, had to take it off from you. Jesus took it off from us. Lord, we thank you for the cup of rejoicing. Lord, we thank you for the precious blood. We thank you that we get to show your death. Hallelujah. And that in your death, we, we, we raptured in your resurrection too. And that in your death, we're not only raptured in your resurrection, but we also raptured in your exaltation. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Listen, I want you to discern the, I want you to discern the body tonight. I want you to discern what Christ did for you. I want you to discern that he's washed away all of your sins. I don't want you sitting here saying, I'm still a sinner. There is a verse of scripture, one verse of scripture that can be understand, understood from the Greek language. It can be translated properly three different ways. And I hear so many people misapply the verse of scripture where Paul describes where he was first a sinner and say, you know, Paul confessed that he was the chief of sinners. Well, you know what? Then that flies in the face of at least more than a hundred times he, his confession of the very righteousness and the glory and life of Jesus being made manifest in him. More than, more than a dozen times of his confession of where he lived blameless without offense. And I could go on. Why is it that people want to take one verse of Scripture in which God says very clearly, let everything be established in Matthew 2, three witnesses, and begin to try to overthrow the faith? The faith is that my sin has been washed away. The faith is that by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have made the righteousness of God in him. He who knew no sin became the sin offering for us that by, huh, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. For the righteousness of God without the law has now been made manifest at this juncture in time. Given to us as a free gift. The new covenant. I want you to discern the body of Christ. I want you to understand that people around you, our members in particular of the body of Christ, you can't despise or look down on anyone. And if you do, you got yourself a problem. So just repent. Get it right and start honoring those that the Lord is honored and blessing those that the Lord is blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Start knowing everybody after the Spirit. Now, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. I don't know how to thank you. I don't know how to thank you. I don't even know how to begin. Stop playing for just a minute. I don't even know how to begin. I don't even know how to begin. Words fell us, Lord. All we can do is say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your precious blood. Whew. Hallelujah. Mm, that's sweet. There's no leaven there. I had no leaven tonight. No leaven in the bread. No leaven in the cup. Everybody, would you stand with me? Thank you, Jesus. I'm, I am looking for a move of God and believing for a move of God that can only take place when the condition of the hearts are right. It isn't about how much we holler. It isn't about how much we jump. It isn't about how loud we scream or how loud we praise. It's about a condition. The condition of the heart being just right. The conditions being just right. The Word of God gets us in condition. The Holy Spirit gets us in condition. Tonight we've just been proclaiming the Word. We've been declaring those things that God has done in the past. Just wanting to seed you to believe that God's going to do it again. He's not done. You're going to have to, there's, going to, there's got to be a decision made in our lives about how far we're going to go with him, 
about how much we're going to walk away away from so that we can spend more time with him doing the things he wants us to do. So, Father, here we stand in in such a need of a miracle because there's nothing going to happen and nobody going to change and nobody going to be different. Things will remain as they've always been until the events take place within our life and the response takes place within our life that you're waiting for. Father, we pray that we'll fully respond to everything that you've done. That there won't be anybody who will draw back. There won't, anybody, won't be anyone in this place that holds back. But everybody will begin to lift up their voice and cry out to you day and night. And give you no rest. You know, I just feel, I, I feel in my spirit. I feel... That there's things that the Spirit of the Lord wants to do in a number of different people's, person's life here. To just re, to release you from things that have held on to you. So I want you to lift your hands towards heaven right now. In an act of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That there can be a flow in your life. That there could be a Holy Ghost flow in your life. That there won't be a hindrance. That there won't be a resistance. But there will be a continual flow. <laughs> that there will be a continual flow of authority. There will be a continual flow of faith. There will be a continual flow of fellowship. That you'll, that, you'll, that you'll take a hold of these things which God has given and not live without them. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now just be filled with the Spirit. The Lord says He wants you to be. There's one way to redeem the times. For the day is evil. Don't be drunk with wine where it is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. So I just want you to begin to be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Seeking and making melody in your heart. I want you to just begin to be filled with the Spirit right now. I want you to begin to let the flow of heaven take hold of you. Let, just, let a melody come. Are you feeling okay? You okay? Suraba ba sikida, suraba ba ba sikida, uraba ba ba rene imbrusitis. Yerebe be na ya, yerebe be me na yeshaya, yerebe be manushikaya. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord, we praise you. We bless you. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you. Thank you, living God. Hallelujah. Thank you, living God. Thank you for the precious blood. Thank you for the word of life. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Kosari mandala mandur to say. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for your flesh. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for this life. 
Thank you for your grace. I pray in the name of Jesus that you find a realm of interacting with the Lord that is just so sweet, that is so joyous, that is so filling. <laughs> that a place that you love to go to, a place that you love to live in, a place that you never tire of, that you never weary, never weary of, that you get refreshed by. I pray that your fellowship will become so sweet in Him that it won't be a labor of love. Uh, but it will be a refreshing love in Jesus' name. I pray that you'll go from this place and you won't, you won't just won't live another life. I pray you go from this place living this life that he's given to us in his son, Jesus. <laughs> Father wants you to find the joy of it. He wants you to find the peace of it. He wants you to find the love of it, the glory of it. And there's no time like the present. <laughs> Amen. find a bunch of people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them. Somebody said, I want more love in my life. Well, then you need to hug more people. You're going to have to participate with love. Listen, if there's anybody that wants prayer for anything, we're here to pray with you and for you. I mean, if you've got sick or sickness or disease or pain and problems in your life, we're here to pray with you. Don't forsake giving and worshiping the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. Let God work a miracle through your obedience. If you're weary, he wants to refresh you. If you're fatigued, he wants to strengthen you. Assemblies of God denomination in a, in a nation one day, they called me up and said, we want you to do the pastor's conference. I said, well, okay, what's it about? They said, we want you to come minister on burnout. I said, look, I don't even need to come. I got it right here for you. Just take it over the phone. You got a pen? They that wait upon the Lord shall not burn out. They shall run and not be weary. Amen. In Jesus' name. No, 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 no. We're not done. In Jesus' name. Luman the better say no. In Jesus' name. It's okay. It's just, let's just stay with the meeting. I right? bless you. It's just it's a, it's holy ground, people. It's holy ground, right? It, are we trying to help people understand? Meeting's not done until it's done. It's just if we can just return to the sacred, if we could just return to the reverence, if we could just return to the holy, if we could just return to the honoring, huh? If we could just return to an awe and a great respect. If we could just return. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what God said he'd do? He said he would destroy Rahab, which is a word that means defiance, which is a word used for Egypt. Destroy defiance. Hallelujah. Wound the head of the dragon. Amen. He's going to get all this stuff out of the way. 
Father's going to get all the stuff out of the way that prevents him from doing through his people those things which he desires to do. For he's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, without any blemish. The things the Father is going to do in the earth today, he will do through his church. He won't do through any, he's not going to do it any other way. He said, sit at Cornelius' house, send for Peter. He said, Simon the Tanner's house in a street called Straight. I want the wind of the Spirit to blow through every person's life, to move through it, flow through every person's life. If the power of God's going to flow out to a dry and thirsty land, it's going to flow out through you and me. And if we're going to interact with the Holy Spirit, if we're going to be taught to move with Him, He's the sacred Spirit. It's another way. He's the sanctifying Spirit, the consecrated Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of sanctification, the Spirit of consecration. The spirit of reverence. The spirit of sacred. He loves us so much, but you know. And we're privileged to get to love him. And it's just a beautiful love relationship. But still sacred. Still holy. Still awesome. Still dreadful. Still. So much. Spirit of the Lord is here to touch you, Raquel. He's here to give you whatever you need. No one comes to Him and sent away empty. No one comes and asks of Him help and ends up not getting help. He's healer, Savior, deliverer. What do you want? If you could have anything tonight, listen to me. If you could have anything settled in your life so it doesn't trouble you anymore, what would that be? You want your papa to be saved. Father, we ask you to do a work. Look at me. I just want you. To, I just want to hook up with you here. Father, we ask you to do a work in your mercy and your grace. That whatever it takes to shake Raquel's father into reality. Because he knows about you, Lord. Right? But he's never had an encounter with you. So, Lord, we ask you, in your mercy, shake him. Because father's not going to violate his will. But he sure does scream and holler to try to do everything he possibly can do to prevent people from going the wrong way. Somebody said, oh, you can't, you can't tell me what to do. No, I can't. But I can sure scream and holler and tell you you're walking the wrong way. And I'm going to do that. Who's got pain in their left shoulder? Who's having problems with their left shoulder? It's your right shoulder? But it's, okay, that's fine. But who's got pain in their left shoulder? Is pain going out of your left shoulder right now? Somebody has pain in their left shoulder. The Lord's going to touch your shoulder. You know, when the Lord says that, I would, if I had pain in my left shoulder, I'd run. I'd die. I, mean, I wouldn't wait. I mean, you know, it's, it sounds too, I'm not going to say it. In Jesus' name. How's your shoulder? She's taking care of everything. Huh? Look at me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command this affliction go off your body. This torment and harassment go out of your mind. I give you peace. Do you know the Lord said that I could do that? He said, if you go in the house and the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. That's pretty radical. <laughs> then I got something I can give. He gave me something that the world can't take away, and he said, you go ahead and give it away. In Jesus' name, I command you to have peace. And I have to bet you feel better now. Say, so your, how you doing? Let your, let your arm. What's wrong with it? Jack Cole. In Jesus' name.
the old foul tormenting thing. Leave this life alone. Every spirit that belongs to Hinduism, I break the power of it now. Now in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. No more sorrow and depression. No more sorrow and depression. No more torment and affliction. You're not supposed to have that. Okay? So don't have that. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. In Jesus' name. All the pains of death let go of you. All the sorrows of death let go of you. Father, call Lockie, your daughter, right, Lockie, into the kingdom. Huh? Did I say it right, Lockie? Now, listen, you don't have any, you don't have any. Yeah, get rid of this. It's your house. Your house. You know, in the book of Acts, when they had a move of God going on, when the power of God was moving in the midst, people get saved. You know what they would do? They would take the stuff that belongs to this world and they would go, they'd go have a fire. You know, I, I, I love one of the things that Reinhardt does. I just love it. Is that he'll just have a big bonfire. Everybody brings their paraphernalia that belongs to sin and wickedness and iniquity and just big, big, and burn it. I believe churches need to start doing that in the United States of America. People don't understand this, but, you know, it, this didn't happen to later in my life because it, it, when I was younger, I didn't understand it. I didn't know it, too. I'd hear all the men of God talk about, hey, man, you know, there, there's demon power on that music. And people would tell me there, there's witchcraft in the music. I mean, we're just like, you guys are old-timey Pentecost. I mean, how do you even know that kind of thing, right? Then later on in my life, the Lord began working in, with me in discerning spirits. I, I would look at those I would look at those albums just or the CDs or see the guys on a commercial on television and I would see them and the spirit of the Lord say to me witch warlock the occult I mean just name the stuff just name it and I mean it's like I mean the things that people listen to the it just I mean literally huh and you know that's if that being true, then their medium is a their media is a medium. You want to get rid of this stuff? Need to get rid of that stuff. And not only that, but Satan's planting seeds. There's been many people been divorced. They've been divorced. You're listening to me on the web. You're listening to me on YouTube right now. It got a divorce because a, 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 a soap opera or a movie sowed a seed into your spirit. That you were being mistreated by your husband or your wife, and there was something better for you, and you didn't really get your right soulmate or whatever it was. And literally, I remember hearing the old Pentecostal preachers say that they could see demons come out of the television and enter into people. And I just thought, man, that's wild to me. Come on. But now that I'm older, now that I've spent more time with Jesus, I've been taught more by the Holy Ghost to discern good from evil, huh? right from wrong. I, get, I see the same thing. You need to watch what you're handling. Watch what you're touching. Somebody said, I just got constantly problem with lust. It's because you're participating with lasciviousness. It's a work of the flesh. Jesus said, uh, Paul said that those who do these things have no inheritance in the kingdom of God or of Christ. You listen to me now. You're going to have to renounce that stuff. Because you're just, well, everybody else does it. That's no excuse. The Lord tells us to make a clean break with the world. Satan has a design, a strategic design. He actually is the God of this world, the one who designed culture and society as we know it. He is behind the movie industry and the formula by which they make movies. Be careful. Don't handle that stuff. Taste not, touch not, handle not. For all will perish with the using. Listen to me. 
then it becomes a seed in your spirit working in your mind and Satan is able to use it see all that is in the world not all that is in my heart all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and the pride of life it's not of the father I'm of the father you're of the father the love of God is in us He's written his laws and his ways upon our heart and upon our mind so that we do them. That's the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, uh, 14, uh, 10, 16. Quoting Jeremiah 30, 33. And I mean, you know, the list of verses of scripture that I could give you on that. But nonetheless, keeping with what I'm saying. Understand, people. You can't be fellowshipping with demons. You can't sit at the communion table and rise up to play. We can't sit down with the Father. God, what's fellowship at? What's light with darkness? What's wrong over here? Why is the baby having problems? What's wrong? Is the baby sick? Huh? I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it. Is that it? Is that the problem? Are you being grumpy because you're tired? Or are you being grumpy because you're rebellious? It's not rebellious. You're being grumpy because he's tired. Don't think of it. Don't, don't think of the worst case scenario. He's got a demon. No, he does. <laughs> what do you need? What do you want? Do you have all that you have? Do you have all that you have need of? Do you? Do you have all that you have need of? It's not a trick question. I'm asking you for a confession. Do you have all that you have need of? You need to get your heart and eyes set on Jesus. Because you think about other things. Just see him. Just see Jesus. Determine to know nothing but Jesus. And him crucified for you. And everything is going to get splendid. And beautiful and complete. And now you are complete in him. Yeah? Yeah? Look at me. Now, do you have all that you have need? Do you have everything that you have need of? Did you guys slip in behind or did I miss you? I'm coming back to you. No, I'm, what's up? No, I'm going to come over here. What's up? Didn't reach, down, reach down and touch your toes in Jesus' name. Father, we said. Now, looky here. See, looky here. Yes. All you need is a miracle, right? Yes. yes, scoliosis. All you need is a miracle. You reckon there's something terrible wrong with you is why you don't get a miracle? That's good. I'm glad this. <laughs> Some of you think there's something terrible wrong with them. That's why they don't get a miracle. No, we just need a miracle. Lord, work a miracle for your heart. You've been living without a pacemaker for two years. It's just a dead in there. The battery died two years ago, eh? Isn't that funny? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that glorious? Oh, battery died two years ago. You need a, you need a pacemaker, but so the doctor says. Okay, so grace needs a miracle. She has scoliosis, congenital disease. Jesus. Jesus saw a woman bent over. I just love Jesus. <laughs> Everything about him. He see, comes in and it comes in the poor old lady. She's all bent over. He said, I'm straightening her out. I'm not having her bent over like that. Lord Jesus, straighten grace out, we pray. <laughs> straighten her out. Make this back straight. Now you walk around in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the miracle. I thank you for the miracle. Yes. Worship him and praise him and thank him for the miracle because he's the miracle worker. Don't try to talk him into it because that's doubt and unbelief. He doesn't need to be talked into taking care of you. He loves you. Thank him for the miracle. And just do that. Just walk around being happy, thanking him for the miracle, knowing that he's, good, he's working a miracle for you.
Amen. Hey. What's going on down here? I'm drawn this way. What's up, baby? You need prayer. You need Papa. I'll pray for you. Huh? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. She grabs her teddy bears. She tries to hold her hands up. Of course, they fall down. She goes, be healed in Jesus' name. Hey? Thank you, Jesus, for touching my baby. Is there anything you need, baby? Hmm? Lord Jesus, we just thank you for touching baby. Thank you for our miracle. La sukaya de Maya. Siempre botusi. Filled up with the Holy Ghost. Filled in Jesus' name. And Elizabeth needs some prayer. Well, lay hands on her. Get your hands up there and lay hands on her. Get after it. Go ahead, pray for her, baby. Don't pay attention to everybody out there. You're supposed to lock in with God. Shut in with the Lord. Go ahead. You want to pray? You want me to pray? Jesus, thank you for touching Auntie Elizabeth. That's my baby. What's up? Yeah, pain. See, I just been, been feeling that old pain thing. Ain't no reason for you to have pain. No pain in Jesus' name. Isn't that what you said? No pain in Jesus' name, and the pain went away. I heard you. I heard you told the blood to stop flowing too, something like that. Oh, Dad, yeah. How are you doing? Huh? Good. You're doing good. Birasukuri ni shipakiana, irishipaya. No more pain. Good. Yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> what do you need? What do you need? Do you, how, do you know we love you? Do you know that the Lord loves you? Are you good with that? Do you feel good about that? Are you certain of it? Good. You know he's never going to stop loving you? You know he says I'll never leave you nor forsake you? You know that? Isn't it good? So it says sometimes I don't feel his presence. You know what you do? Just start praising him. Start giving thanks. Start shouting to the Lord. Oh, Rabbi Basate. So, oh God, I, oh, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you to fill up every dimension in my life. And you won't have that problem anymore. Okay? Now, I... In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for the great outpouring of your glory and your presence upon your daughter's family during the Christmas holidays as she's with her family. So many people here are going to be with your families. Just love on them. Just love them. Don't try to impress them with all the Bible knowledge that you have. Just love on him. Amen. Lift your hands towards heaven. What you what's up? You're going to see your family. And you want extra strength. healing waters flow to dad, to mom, to aunts, to uncles, to brother. Do you have a sister? 
just a moment. Uh, release the volume. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that Veronica will, Veronica will come to realize that there is a realm of your manifest presence, a grace that you give to us. And no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we're just comforted by you and overwhelmed with your peace and with your goodness and with your love. And that that breaks the hardest hearts, it melts the hardest hearts and breaks the most difficult chains. <laughs> Just the tone to me. What's up? anyone told her about Jesus? She's a Jehovah's Witness. Well, that's a big old yoke to break. Somebody just needs to go tell her Jesus is God, God Almighty. And he wants to heal her and prove himself to her. Where's she at? Oh, it's far, far away. Now, who is it that asked for this? Okay, chemist. Father, nothing is impossible for you. Lord, it's easy for you to work this miracle of bringing this woman out of the bondage of the witch tower of Jehovah's Witness. Which is a terrible thing to even say. I mean the Jehovah's Witness part because they're not. Lord, we ask you to break off that yoke. I mean the pancreatic cancer is a minor thing. So we send the word right now, in Jesus' name, Father, that she may have more time to live. I don't believe that people can go into the kingdom of God believing that Jesus is like an angel. Jesus is Michael the archangel. That yoke has got to be broken, and the yoke that the yoke is only going to be broken when the church begins to live in the glory of of the Holy Ghost and the glory of the presence of Jesus and the bright shining light of His person and power. Right now, it's like the church, like Christianity, is just another one in the number. It doesn't stand out. Oh, but when the fire of God's moving in the midst of God's people. Huh? huh? Amen? Amen? Just lift your hands towards heaven. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you more. Bill, so glad he learned to trust you. Jesus, Jesus, save your friend. Jesus name Father I thank you for this consecrating sanctifying work of the spirit of the living God people don't know it they don't understand it they don't value it what it means to God 
for you to begin to talk to him about his miracle works in our lives. We begin to thank him for his blood that cleanses you, for this Holy Spirit that sanctifies and consecrates and gives to us the ability to say no to the world. If you try to do it legalistically or out of their own effort. People want to go sell all that they have to obtain a pearl of great price and they've not seen the pearl. Time to see the pearl. In Jesus' name. I mean, you've seen the pearl. Just begin to talk to the Lord and ask Him to say, Lord, I want to live this consecrated life, this separated life, this holy life. This sanctif- I, love the san- I love sanctification. To be for holy use. I'm the purchased possession. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. So are you. Amen. What is it that you want? Sure. No, it's... Okay, well, let me tell you then what you have to do. You know, if you stay in the Word of God, if you stay, if you stay in the place where you're communing with the things that are going on in Father's thoughts, which is described and expressed to us by His Word, it drives out doubt and unbelief and all the noise of this world that is a place where it's anti-God, it's anti-Christ. It has every lying spirit, every voice that would try to deny the power of God. Those things have no place to operate when you allow His Word to dwell in you, in your thoughts, in your heart. Thy Word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. But now the Lord says we're born of the incorruptible seed by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. But that, listen, the communion and the fellowship with His Word. Hallelujah. Harobo sekena. I mean, it's living. It's spirit and it's life. It's powerful. It's interacting with Him. And I'm pinpointing for you. Don't have those things in your life. Don't have those things. Don't have novels in your life. Novels, reading novels. Somebody said to me, well, what's the difference between reading a novel and going to the movie? Well, you're intimate, getting more intimate with it. It becomes your meditations. It becomes your thoughts. You better be careful what those meditations and thoughts are. Movies are so effective because they are so skillfully designed to completely draw you in emotionally, literally, spiritually, so that you may have a, an experience. Of like you live vicariously through those things that are going on there. People, you got to be careful with this stuff now. You got to understand the power of it. People just act like it's some kind of sterile, you know, neutral thing. It's not. And then they wonder why they're having to deal with these strongholds, these imaginations. Why are they having to deal with these problems? Why is this recurring thing going on, harassing thought? I said in Jesus' name, holiness under the Lord. In Jesus' name, according to the word of the living God, I said holiness under the Lord. That's what God said. So that's what I said. Holiness under the Lord. Amen. I mean, if he takes a priest and anoints a priest and makes him holiness unto the Lord, what do you think happens to you when you get the miracle of salvation? Amen. Talk about holiness unto the Lord. Goodness. What is it that you need, Raphael? You want to fill your spirit? I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. But the Lord says, be filled then. He empowers us to be filled. He just says, be filled. That's empowerment. I'm going to pray for you, okay? Every harassing, tormenting thing messed with your head and your mind, your spirit. I break it off of you now, in Jesus' name. You just might enjoy living the life of Christ.
Amen. So what is it that you need over here? I said, there is a place of rest I find where all my burdens I leave behind. Leslie gives that wisdom to, to Leslie. You know what? Don't let it bother you. Listen, listen, and listen. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it bother you. The Lord doesn't need anyone to defend him. He's good on his own. He's really got to tell you. What's up over here, girls, ladies, women of the Lord? Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. Now you get to live there the rest of your life. And if anything ever tries to prevent, prevent that, then you just run through the troop and leap over there. You know, when I discovered, when I discovered that I could always have a move of God in my life, then I decided I'm not going to live without one. Okay? It's like some of you say, oh, the meeting was so good. I got touched by the Lord. You know, well, praise the Lord for that. That's wonderful. But you should live that way. And you just going to have to understand this and not be ignorant to the devices of Satan anymore. Huh? Stir yourself up in your most holy Amen. faith. Amen. That's right. Huh? But what if you don't know how to pray in the Holy Ghost? Better press it quick <laughs> What if you don't know how to pray in the Holy Ghost? The scripture says, stir yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What if you don't even know how to do that? Start crying out to God. Say, Father, teach me how to pray in the Holy Ghost. Pretty simple, isn't it? You know, when you get this one passage of scripture down, John 15, 5, a whole new world opens up before you. John 15, 5 says, Jesus said, without me, you could do nothing. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> hallelujah. Praise God. Hey? Yes. Quit looking to yourself. When you've got Father there, standing ready to. Hey, how are you doing over here? That's good. <laughs> what do you want? What do you need? You've been sick. What kind of sickness? Pregnancy sickness or virus sickness? Sick as a whole, on the whole. What does that mean? It's not a virus? Oh. I just need to understand what I'm praying for. Lord Jesus, strengthen her immune system. Spiritually. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Look at me. Look at me. Jesus' name. Be healed. In Jesus' name. How are you doing, this sister? What do you want? Well, that's good. She stood in line so long the Lord got to her before anybody else could healed her. But that's the best way. Eh? See, look, people, if there's anything that you learn is that you just, whatever problem is, whatever need you have, just bring it to Jesus. And, and it, it, you don't have to be in the meeting and come to the altar to bring it to Jesus. You can come to him the same way in your living room, in your bedroom, 
walking down the sidewalk. You can come to it in the same way. Lord, I need your touch right now. I'm feeling sick, and I don't want to be sick. How many of you have been learning how to live in divine health? It's great, isn't it? He has it for us. He's the healer. This is Jesus saving us. Well, we love all of you. You don't have to be in a hurry to go anywhere. Oh, come. Don't want to be, don't want to leave anybody out. How are you doing? Oh. Ezekiel, Ezekiel sick with the mom, months and mumps and he's, yeah, mumps and he's watching. How old is he? Three years old. Ezekiel, listen to me right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to be healed. Now you obey me. I'm the pastor. Be healed. Right now, those mumps have to go off of you. The disease has to leave your body. The power of God touches you right now. So he's, he, you're doing good now. Hey, you can hear him. He's over there shouting all the way to, via the web to El Centro. Are you standing in line for prayer or are you helping me? You're helping me. We would just keep simulating. Hey, how is it coming? How is it going over here? Oh, Judah. Praise God. How is communion tonight? They praise the Lord. Feel the presence of the Lord? Could you feel the What do you want? What do you need? Oh, you got a little nervous thing going on? You're picking your nails? His biggest problem in his life is picking his nails now. <laughs> Bless your heart. Okay, look at me. Look here. That's good. You're not picking your nails no more. Okay? Look here. Look at, pa look at Pastor. No more picking the nails. Okay? Now look here. Look here. Looking at me? Are you staring at me over here? Uh-huh. <laughs> Somebody said, why on earth should we be steering? Well, I'm just, I'm just doing it like Peter and James and John did it. I'm just doing it like Jesus did it. I'm learning, I learned from them. Look on us. You know, I speak peace into your little heart, in your little life. You're not going to be nervous. There's not going to be no nervousness. You're not going to feel nervous about anything. There's going to be nothing but peace all around you. Peace in mama, peace in daddy, peace in big sister faith. Okay? Amen. No nervous things. Okay? Just filled up with the goodness of the Lord. It really isn't anything harder than that. Because as he's doing the work, we the announcers, he does the work. Huh? That's what he tells us. He said, he said tell me, lay my hands on the sick. He'll take care of me. He said, go tell the people. Go open the eyes of the blind. Pretty radical, ain't it? What are you going to be doing the rest of your life? That's awesome. What do you want right now? Well, how can I help? Yeah, it's just. How are you doing, dear? How are you? Are you? Are you doing? Are you doing better with that area? Depression is a spirit nothing to do with serotonin levels or any other neurological um, tags. It is, it's, it's spirit. You know, you just resist it, steadfast in the faith. You're doing better, though. I see that. Huh? There's not a psychiatrist or a psychologist in the world can give you what Jesus has given you over the past six months. It's true. And then listen to me. All you do is just give thanks to him. Just praise him. Just thank him for his love. Also, you can just, do, just sing, like, sing little songs like, I'm the apple of your eye. Hallelujah. I'm the apple of your eye. Hallelujah. I'm the apple of your eye. You're so good 
to me oh lord you're so good just do stuff like that huh hey really it's that practical be filled with the spirit speak to yourself in psalms and hymns spiritual songs Father, we thank you that you completely healed Jonathan's life spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. Thank you, Jesus. What's up? I don't believe you can have communion by yourself, but we can see if we can work that out. You understand? Communion by yourself is an oxymoron. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can have communion with the Lord Jesus. I mean, I understand that. And, but I'm just, it's really for the body of Christ. It's for the church. Jesus was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given to you. Huh? Which is broken for you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Why? So you can enter into the, to the holy realm. So you can enter into the heavenly realm. So that you live in the provision of God. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take it. Eat it. And after that day is supped, he said, this is the blood, my blood. Hallelujah. This is the new covenant, new testament in my blood, which is given to you so that your sins be washed away. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your love. I'm not going to turn anybody away, ever. We work a miracle for you. You're going to work it out. stay right there and I'm not guaranteeing you're going to get it because all Father needs is a bunch of people just begin to want him so desperately they're going to be moved to tears over it. I tell you you get moved that, you get moved that deeply. Come on. I'm, huh? And nobody loves you so much as he loves you. He said he'd collect all your tears in his bottle. And my wife loves me but she doesn't love me that much. She's never collected a single tear of mine and I love her but I've never collected her tears. Is he amazing? Is he amazing? He's amazing. Don't you ever doubt that love? Don't doubt the love. In Jesus' name. Amen. I love all of you guys. Thank you, Jesus. for me.
Thank you for 